So one of the uh, innovations from last year, or was it two years ago? Last year, was DocSF Science. And DocSF Science, the concept there was, um, how can we find the data, the evidence, to support change? And when we started DocSF, there really wasn't any data, but now there is increased number of data. And who best to ask that question than Fabrizio Billy, a partner in crime, has been very, very, uh, he's one of our co-hosts uh, for DocSF, and has been uh, working tirelessly with this team to review literally hundreds of papers to find the ones that are most meaningful. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Fabrizio, who's a PhD and professor at UCLA, the Department of Orthopedics in the, bio, in the medical engineering, in the ortho engineering department. What's the right terminology? Orthopedics. No, oh really? Yeah. The whole thing. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> yes, thank you. Very excited to be here. And uh, um, don't know if you realize, but now I have the hardest job which is uh, to keep you awake after lunch, and uh, doing so, uh, talking and discussing some papers, which is, to me, it's, it looks like her heroics. So, you know, very exciting stuff until, uh, until this moment we heard yesterday and today. Um, the, the, the advancement of technology these days is so fast that uh, sometimes we feel like uh, we are living in one of those dystopian worlds uh, coming out of uh, a Gibson novel, a Neuromancer, or uh, Stephen So's No Crash, or The Matrix, or uh, Minority Report. And, um, and for some of us, that's exciting. It's, you know, we see some of those ideas come into reality. For others, it's frightening. And uh, for a part of us, uh, you know, it's also something that we don't know how to interpret it. So uh, skepticism. So and how we make sense of all these uh, technology that are coming to us to an ever faster pace. And the answer to that is with evidence and looking at the evidence. And this is what DocSF is about. So DocSF uh, was created to present you the latest papers uh, done in, uh, um, published in uh, digital orthopedics, reviewing them, uh, screening hundreds, as Stefano said, hundreds of paper, and reviewing them for you and presenting it to you in hopefully you know, a fast-paced, uh, very exciting way, a new way to discuss in, and, and present it. it we think about DocSF Science as a, a journal club on steroids, and that's what it is. So, um, I'm assuming that's it. So, uh, we will have uh, four segments uh, that you will be uh, two today and two tomorrow. Uh, you see here, uh, we screen actually 316 papers uh, that were reviewed by uh, our reviewers. In reality, uh, this year alone, we went through 1,216 abstracts. Huge amount of work. Um, we employed tenure, 10 senior reviewers, uh, and the three top papers for each segment were selected and will be presented, discussed with you. So the first part, which is today, uh, is going to be large language models and AI chatbots. And then we will have another session on AI, AI and big data. Tomorrow, sensor and XR. And then um, um, RS and cobots. And uh, that's how the prepare will be presented. Uh, first part today, large language model and AI chatbots. And I want to invite on the podium, uh, my partners in crimes, uh, the reviewers that will discuss with us uh, this paper. Gavin, here you are. Gavin is a, is a professor at uh, UC Davis. Um, he went to med school in India. He did his ortho residency in UK. Yeah. Finally, you are prodded 
to the US. Yes. <laughs> Have a seat. Um, then Tom. So Tom is local, is at UCSF. Um, is the director of the informatic core for the UC UCSF Reach Center for Chronic Low Back Pain. Is an expert in biomedical informatics and computational biologics, digital health technologies, and AI. And then Alan Young. Where are you? Oh, here he is. So Alan is a USC graduate. Hey, nobody's perfect, right? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, so um, he's an orthosurgeon with diverse clinical and corporate and entrepreneurial accomplishment. Uh, he worked at Kaiser Permanente, Deloitte, Accenture, and Slalom. He is currently, he's currently set as an expert uh, consultant on strategy and uh, technology for McKinsey. Thank you so much. Okay. So, okay, Gavin. Uh, this is the first paper we review, the importance of machine learning in autonomous actions for surgical decision making. So All right. what is this paper about? Yeah, um, thank you for allowing me to choose this paper. Um, so I chose this paper because it is um, a primer for people that don't know much about AI and machine learning. And um, it's actually an explainer paper. Uh, and a review paper. The first half of the paper is uh, about AI, and it goes into um, short paragraphs explaining different aspects uh, about AI, machine learning, the different types of uh, networks. Um, and at the end of each paragraph, they explain how it is, uh, how it correlates with surgery. Um, in the second half of the paper, it's a review paper on on papers um, that uh, look into using AI uh, for surgical decision making. So it starts off really broad with um, the 30,000 foot picture of AI and machine learning. Um, and then it comes down to a very narrow uh, focus on uh, surgery, but then an even more narrow focus on autonomous uh, actions in surgery. Um, so it's not, there's no methodology in it. Um, uh, for, in some ways it has, there, there isn't much of orthopedics in it, um, but I think it is generalized and broad enough that it would apply to uh, any surgeon. And I really hope that this was published in a more uh, mainstream journal. I had never heard of the um, Artificial Intelligence and Surgery Journal. Uh, they only have a few um, uh, issues. It's an open source. Um, and a quick word about the authors. Uh, the authors uh, are all from Germany. Uh, they started a surgical data science initiative in 2025. Um, they wrote a couple of uh, white papers on it. And it's a sort of a movement to get AI into surgery. So I think this is a very well-written paper. Um, that uh, I, uh, gives, a, gives noobs like me and, and AI a much clearer, I've, I've done online courses on uh, machine learning, but I think this gave me a very succinct view very clearly, very quickly. Tom, what's your thought? Yeah, uh, well, first off, thanks for having me here today. Uh, I thought this paper was really great. Uh, like you said, it's sort of a, a thousand foot bird's eye view, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, and what we're outlining here on the screen is, you know, a bunch of different ways in which AI can help in the surgical setting. Um, and unfortunately, I can't read that small over there. But, you know, uh, this can really uh, uh, interact with uh, everyday life in the surgical setting uh, in many, many ways, right? So they can be things that are helping you uh, so it can uh, reduce uh, clinician burden. Uh, it can be things that automate certain processes, right? So it frees you up to do other things as well. Uh, it, you know, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, ChatGPT, like everyone does in, in the next uh, few slides. Uh, but you know, these are things that can help you, say, summarize um, uh, a patient uh, record. Uh, it can help you formulate emails. Uh, so there's, there's really a, a lot of different ways in which uh, AI can be used. Uh, and you know, a lot of them, we might not even know what they are yet. Alan? 
Yeah, thank you all for having me again. It's a pleasure and an honor to be next to these esteemed speakers. I agree with everything that was said. It's a great primer. Uh, it reminds me of when I first started learning about data science and AI many years ago. And it touches upon things like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, and shines some light on some of the challenges. One of them is the amount of data coming through all of our digital applications, interoperative devices, cameras, um, medical devices that have sensors, it all creating data. And the challenge with AI is you have to have, for some of these learning models, labeled data, which is very painstaking to do and requires an, an expert like an orthopedic surgeon to do some of that. Some of the other models allow for unlabeled data, so unsupervised learning allows you to get insights or spot patterns with unlabeled data. So that's becoming kind of more and more popular. So definitely this paper helps shine a light on the different methodologies to use. And one of the other things it points to is two kind of early applications of this information. One of them was looking around predictive or clinical decision making, so providing information or insights to clinicians at the point of care to possibly make different clinical decisions for patient safety. And then the second one was really around OR efficiencies, looking at using machine learning to calculate things such as turnaround time or optimizing surgical duration estimations, things that help, as we heard earlier today, about the, the functioning and operating and efficient usage of facilities like ambulatory surgery centers. Thank you. A uh, question that I have is, uh, uh, as normal with creating these models, uh, we need to consider bias in the way they are built. So the paper doesn't address that. And how important do you think is bias when we are creating these models? Tom, you wanna? Very. <laughs> now, uh, uh, bias is something that affects all AI models, right? So uh, if you think uh, something going into making the model, you are likely to affect how the model behaves and what it's ultimately going to tell you, right? And if some of your initial assumptions are false, then that gets baked into the cake too. Alan? Yeah, I think that's, I agree, bias is inherent in a lot of the, the news we hear about AI models. Uh, and it touches upon two things. One of it is explainability, uh, the ability to look at a machine learning algorithm and understand it and interpret it, or is it a black box where no one knows exactly how the convoluted neural network ran and what the hidden layers were and what the output layers are. All those things can cause people to have lack of faith in the models itself. And the second thing you talked about is bias and kind of equity in AI. I think that's one of the things where inherently people who build models will kind of infuse their own biases into it. And as you look at for interpretive models of how to uh, deploy these different solutions, bias can also creep in in thinking about what setting or what application would be most useful for these technologies. I think that's a big challenge because coming from the orthopedic surgery perspective, we may have a certain <coughs> preference of using AI in a certain way, and you go to the primary care setting or you go to the hospital administrators, they will have a different perspective on that. Gavin, 10 seconds. Yeah, I, I think we always look at biases as a negative thing, but we should also note that um, when we democratize um, information and we have large amounts of data, there is also a possibility that human biases could be uh, equilibrated. And it may actually try and eliminate biases if, if we do it properly. Thank you. Let's move to the other one. Okay, Tom. Great. Uh, so this is a paper called the Diagnostic and Triage Accuracy of the GPT-3 Artificial Intelligence Model, right? So obviously we've talked about this a lot today. Uh, as you're aware, uh, this is rapidly developing. Uh, so in uh, 2020 was when the GPT-3 model was released, and you guys didn't know about that, right? <laughs> and then in November 2022, it became very popular because they had uh, uh, ChatGPT, which is very accessible, right? Uh, and these things are only going to get more and more powerful as we go along, right? So what we're looking at here is we're looking at um, uh, diagnostic and triage accuracy of ChatGPT, right? So what they did is uh, this research group from Harvard, uh, since before ChatGPT, has been curating a set of vignettes uh, that have a diagnosis associated with them, right? Uh, so if you didn't have ChatGPT here, what you'd be looking at is a layperson in blue trying to read these vignettes and make a diagnosis, right? So they have access to the internet, they can go on WebMD, et cetera. Uh, and in green, I believe that's green, yes. And in green, uh, we have a, a professional clinician, right? So uh, these are uh, uh, Harvard um, primary care doctors who give their professional opinion on the vignettes. 
Um, and this is their, uh, uh, their performance metrics for uh, comparing the two, right? So you can see that the middle bar here is ChatGPT. So uh, we did some prompting with ChatGPT to uh, uh, tell it that you're trying to make some diagnoses, and here's the vignettes, and then uh, we set it go. We let it go and say, uh, you know, what was the diagnosis? Uh, so um, some of these uh, orange bars are a little bit bigger than the green bars, uh, but what you should be looking at are the error bars, right? Uh, so uh, uh, the results of this is that uh, ChatGPT is not as good as a uh, expert uh, clinician, um, and it's about as good as a regular person with the internet, right? Um, so this is, uh, keep in mind, this is only ChatGPT3. Uh, obviously, ChatGPT4 is already available, um, and there's even some other types of models uh, that might be even better at this, right? So one of the cool things we have at UCSF is we have all the clinical notes from all the University of California medical school campuses, uh, and they have been de-identified, uh, and we want to use these to train a model, right? So if you have something like that, or access to, say, clinicians' uh, uh, notes, uh, or maybe um, some medical-specific information that you're feeding uh, the large language model, then it, I think it can get better than this, obviously. Um, but whether or not it's going to be able to outperform a clinician, um, it's, it's hard to tell. Alan? Yeah, it's interesting. Just earlier, you asked me about bias, and I think it's interesting that the primary care physicians in this study were all Harvard Medical School graduates or professors. And so that obviously creates an inherent bias. You set your bar, uh, maybe I'd say slightly higher than the average clinician. Um, second of all, looking at the differences between the two, the GPT-3 was looking at diagnostic capabilities and triage capabilities. And when it came to diagnosing, it was actually performed close to the clinicians at almost 90%. But when it came to triage, it actually performed closer to the average adult using the internet, closer to 70%. So that kind of brings up two questions. I think you touched upon it. The fact that this language model was not trained on medical-specific literature. It was just pulled off you know, an entire database of 175 billion you know, words or, or sites. And so to that point, the accuracy could be improved with kind of medical-specific training. But it also goes to show there's some danger in uh, using kind of these tools without a human in the loop. For example, we had a, a major health system work with us in the past around using a, tr creating an AI-driven chatbot to triage, because they thought certain patients didn't need to come to see the orthopedic spine specialist, for example, or a neurosurgeon. They could go to see their primary care doctor or someone in between. And the idea that, of using a chatbot to triage them kind of created this idea that, well, it has to be accurate. And in this case, you can see that the accuracy is no better than the average person going online and Googling things and their symptoms and deciding, I have enough reason to go see an orthopedic surgeon versus going to see my podiatrist or going to see my PCP. So this kind of raises the, the question of how accurate do we need these models to be? And can we omit the human or the clinician from this decision-making process? Thank you. Gavin. Yeah. Um I think, I, I, I might be confused here, but I think uh, the paper talked about GPT-3 that predates um, ChatGPT. Um, and so this is an older model. Uh, and like you said, uh, uh, ChatGPT-4 is um, even more, um, hopefully more, uh, uh, more, uh, more powerful um, than GPT-3 that um, sort of stopped at 2021. Um, so I think uh, it is likely that these models would, would if they'd had to repeat this this uh, study again with ChatGPT4, it might the orange bars might be closer to the green bars. Um, the other thing I also noted in the paper was that these vignettes were written at a grade six level English, um, which means that it would be easier for the uh, chatbot to um, to recognize the, the words, um, which would not really translate to uh, real life, because you'd be, hopefully most adults would be writing it at the level of, you know, uh, at least grade, uh, at least high school level. So there could be that, uh, that difference. But uh, the other thing they also note in the paper is about biases, like uh, uh, we talked about earlier. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I think this was a well-written paper. Uh, it is already within a year uh, outdated, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Alan. Yes, um, this is an interesting one. So before I joined 
McKinsey, I was the chief medical officer for a number of early stage AI startups, one of which was building a chatbot um, to do kind of what this paper is describing, the ability to really automate some of the communications that typically take place between a provider, their staff, and patients, either before or after surgery. In this case, this is following patients that were, um, had undergone a hip arthroscopy procedure for femoral acetabular impingement and monitored kind of the conversation that they had, whether or not the patient sent messages into the system or the chatbot was able to externally push out messages such as education, reminders, um, medication or pain guidance, et cetera, um, and monitored the success of this. And it followed them for six weeks and it measured it based on kind of user patient satisfaction. As, as we all know, I think my colleague mentioned it earlier, patient satisfaction sometimes doesn't hinge on how well the surgery went or how nice the surgeon was. It could have been a result of them waiting too long or they didn't get a communication or they got a secondary bill from you know, the facility and they didn't expect that. And that could, could kind of you know, bias their overall perception of quality or, or their you know, quality of the care. And so looking at this chatbot, it really set, tried to automate a lot of the messages that normally would be previously traditional patients calling in, right? Patients saying, I have hip pain, I don't know what to do next. Do I need, can I move? Can I go to therapy? When should I come see you again? Can you refill my prescription? This chatbot automated a lot of those messages and tried to triage anything that was um, concerning or safety or otherwise needed to be escalated to a higher level. And what struck me was that if you look at the number of inbound questions, 128, 40 of them were automatically like addressed. So sounds like a big number, but that's less than one third, right? So if you're deploying an AI-based tool and this tool can only handle maybe a third of your, the questions that patients ask, then you have to ask yourself, then when does the nurse or doctor need to step in? And you'll see that there's different intervention periods where it needs to be escalated, there's a patient safety concern and others. So this shows that to me that there's a lot of improvement an opportunity to improve on these tools. Although the patient satisfaction was higher, I, I also think is because they're able to now communicate much more frequently and at a higher kind of, you know, f velocity to their clinicians, whereas before they were limited to saying, you'd have to call my office or I'll talk to you at our next visit. So it enabled patients to kind of own their care a little bit, but it created this extra data, data dump of concerns and questions to the clinical offices that were handled in this case by the chatbot, because normally there's no way a, a, a normal clinical office would handle this extra volume. And I think the numbers of interactions was in the thousands. Tom? Yeah, I thought that this was a really useful tool. Obviously, it's still in its infancy. Um, hopefully, at best, this will be able to reduce clinician burden uh, and help uh, patients uh, uh, better understand either their treatment or their diagnosis or anything they need. Uh, obviously, we have to go back to uh, biases. You know, what was this trained on and is it going to say the right thing? Uh, there's a, a, a technical term uh, that people have decided on called hallucinating, uh, which uh, really just means it's making things up, right? So how do you know whether or not this is saying the correct thing? Uh, you don't always, right? And maybe as we move forward in the future, we're going to get more controls on these types of software. Uh, to be able to say the right things all the time. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. Um, I, this was one of my favorite papers. Um, I did not know um, that the company was Memora that presented this morning. Um, and uh, I, I, I like this paper because there was a lot of thought processes that went behind the methodology uh, because they had uh, got three surgeons to sit down and write down all the uh, 73 questions or whatever that were most likely to be asked by the patient. They then used Amazon uh, MTurk um, to then test those questions uh, to see whether they were repeatable, whether they made any sense. And uh, once they did all that, then they set it out, um, uh, you know, they, they released it uh, to actual patients. Uh, they did have a very small number of, uh, of patients, um, but they did do a power analysis and uh, it was appropriate. Um, what, um, uh, what I liked about the fact was that there was only three quote unquote unsafe um, decisions. Um, the chatbot actually got the confusion, it, it knew, it, had, it was self-aware of uh, how many times it became confused. 
and it uh, deferred to um, uh, to the care team. Uh, the three unsafe um, of the three unsafe, there was only one that was potentially unsafe. Um, and the funny one was where the patient said, "I got pain in my calf," and then didn't say anything anymore. And uh, the, 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 the chatbot didn't reply back. It should have sent a message back to the patient saying, you need to talk to the care team. Um, so I think there is still room for improvement, but I think the way they, uh, they planned it, they prepared it, um, the methodology was pretty good. And I think the outcomes clearly showed that from a, from a clinician's point of view, th this would save my clinic staff so much of time. Um, and an effort. Every morning, my RN comes into the into the clinic. She has about 30 or 40 calls on her um, on a list of uh, things to do, and that just takes away so much time from the the actual stuff that she has to do, the education and and um, clearing patients and stuff like that. So something like this uh, is something definitely I would want in my practice. Okay, thank you very much. We've done for this segment. Uh, Tom, <laughs> you can step out. Or you, no, you, can, you, you need to stay. Alan and Gavin will. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. You, you, stay. Oh, um, yeah, you stay. So, Peter is an orthosurgeon at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. Uh, he's passionate about the application of machine learning and eye to imaging, <coughs> feather learning, and digital art. So thank you, Peter. All right, so let's dive in. So, the first paper, Gavin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Peter, you wanna you wanna drill oh. into it? Oh wait, so I'm uh, I think that I'm doing the other paper though. All right, I've got uh, the paper about predicting okay, so, surgical times. Okay, so this this paper uh, you know um, talks about applying machine learning uh, to aid patient insulation in selection of outpatient um, total joint uh, arthroplasty. So it discusses cases, um, they discusses cases during, uh, taken during 2018 in about eight years. And uh, they built an artificial neural network uh, that was used to predict same day discharge. Uh, and they use, and again, other uh, statistical model uh, to identify variables that are significantly associated with uh, uh, predicted outcomes. So these are some of the results that uh, they got. And uh, I want you guys to kind of drill into the, the data of this paper and the outcomes that uh, they uh, obtained. Alan? Yeah. yeah, it was good to see them using ACS NISQIP, the database that you know, many health facilities populate with their patients and, and a large sample size for eight years and over 250,000 knees and 150,000 hips. What struck me was the accuracy uh, as they took kind of 80% of the, the data to train the model and then 20% to test. Um, there was a distinct difference between the ability to or their accuracy or between the total knee replacement and the total hip. And so that struck me and I'd love to hear from our for our panel, but I think the total knee accuracy was over 80% for both same day and ex short length of stay. And for total hip, it dropped into the 70s. And then overall, the, the um, artificial neural network was more accurate predicting same day discharges as opposed to the short stay. So kind of showing there are limitations to these models as you get larger and larger, but I'm curious is the difference between hip and knees, is it due to the 100,000 case difference, or is there something else going on? Right. Yeah, I was curious about that as well. Saw the difference. I gotta say, I'm not exactly sure why that would be. Um, I, I would say just anecdotally, I, I think I have just as much success getting total hip patients home as I do total knee patients. So uh, I'll pass that on over to the guy sitting next to me. Um, I think the uh, thing that um, ACS NISQIP date, great data, it's clean, it's tidy, I mean, it's some of the best uh, data out there, but of course, like all data, there's um, it bounds on what it has in it. And uh, I would be very curious about incorporating uh, elements of the home environment into a data set. The number of times I hear stairs come up, and I know exactly where that's going in terms of whether or not a same day uh, discharge is going to happen or not. Uh, uh, usually, that's one of the biggest things that comes up for me. Uh, <clears throat> interestingly, um, I was trying to write a paper and send an abstract in for this conference on exactly this. Um, 
but I missed the deadline. Uh, and we did look, and we did look at the Nesquip um, database, and uh, it's all over the place. It's a, it's a good database, but I think there is still a lot of noise in it. Um, one of the things that uh, Nesquip databases don't have is um, geography. So if a patient came from very far away, they would be unlikely to be sent home the same day. So um, there is automatically um, uh, one of those conf confounding factors that we found. Um, I think uh, also uh, who's at home uh, uh, that can take care of the patient and the uh, 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 social background of the patient, uh, uh, their um, uh, social status, uh, dep it might depend uh, what, what kind of, sorry, let me start again. <laughs> um, the, the kind of uh, social network and support that they have at home would also determine whether they're gonna go home the same day. Um, so none of that is in the, in the Nesquip database. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Who wants to introduce this one? Go yeah, ahead. I'll do it. Um, so continuous real-time prediction of surgical case times. I like this paper, and I like it because I think there's actually some learnings in it. Um, uh, so the, the concept's simple. Can you train a model with data that's coming preoperatively as well as intraoperatively to accurately predict uh, how long a case is going to take? And the idea being if you know that a case is going to end on time, you know better how to deploy your resources. And of course, uh, surgeons here in the room know that past a certain time, there's a change of shift and uh, the cost of that gets more expensive. So insofar as those predictions are accurate and able, enable you to make those adjustments, this is a useful tool. Their approach here, so they've got a fairly large data set, 70,000 cases over eight months over eight hospitals. And what they're really testing here is comparing two model architectures. Um, and uh, one is Bayesian. We don't have to go into tremendous detail about what that exactly means. And then they're using another architecture that's an artificial neural network that's ideally suited for looking at patterns and sequences of events, which makes some sense. Um, the thing that I don't like about this paper is actually the results, I, I don't find them to be that good. They don't present one of the key things within the abstract. It's buried in there. They, uh, they looked at actually what the clinical impact of this tool would be. And sure, the artificial neural network is a bit better, but in, in the course of eight months, they identified 11 cases in which they might be able to make a difference. That's not many <laughs> over the course of eight months and 80,000 uh, surgeries. The other thing that they don't do, and I'll, I'll try not to dwell on it, number one is I'd want to know how much money there is on the table. And so basic descriptive stats about how long these procedures took, how many went over the scheduled time, they provide none of that. So those marginal gains might be very, very important if there truly is a lot of money on the table. And then finally, they did something that I just cannot figure out. If you look at the number of cases in their training set, there's 50,000 cases. Take a guess how many were unique case types in terms of a name, like total hip, total knee, yada, yada, yada. Half. How is that possible? So total knee, TKA, TKR, total hip. So I, I tend to wonder if they shot themselves in the foot by having too many case types because half of them were unique. It doesn't make sense to me. Ellen? Yeah, the other thing to add for that is, of, of those case types, I believe, they started with the 70,000, had the test data down to 50 or 60,000. I believe only 10,000, less than 10,000 were orthopedic specific. So that brings into question the applicability of this analysis on ortho cases, which in my experience, if you are a subspecialty orthopedic surgeon, your case duration is a little bit more predictable. At least the guys I know that do hand and joints, they tend to be, and even spine, they tend to know roughly how long their cases are. So if you look at a smattering of other surgical specialties, they have a much broader variety of cases. So that may play into the kind of perceived duration. And then the artificial neural network kind of had a plus or minus or a deviation of up to 13 minutes and the other Bayesian approach produced a variation of 20 minutes. So is that significant? Right. Like in the case of, you can squeeze another case in because you save seven minutes, right? From scheduling perspective. So. The applicability of this is there. They touch upon, again, the costs associated with additional or accurate scheduling. Um, but it'd be useful to see how this would play out in a real clinical setting with kind of live case examples. Right. 
I've, I haven't read this paper, but my question to the paper would be, um, how, what, what was their end result? What was their end game? Uh, what were they trying to achieve by... Yeah, so they, they did a couple of different metrics. One was just a measure of accuracy of the model at predicting um, the time. Uh, then they tried to create a, uh, a little more of a realistic clinical scenario where they said, look, how good is it at predicting it going past 3 p.m., 5 p.m., where all of a sudden maybe the dollars start going up in terms of the cost of uh, the folks running the room. Um, and then uh, they also tried to see if it would generalize to other hospitals in a different setting, and it did about equally well. But those were the metrics they were looking at. All right. Next one. Okay. Anybody? <laughs> well, well, this one takes us kind of back full circle. This, this one looks at they created an outpatient shoulder arthroplasty risk prediction tool using multivariable logistic regression analysis, which is not the current AI or, or the trendy data science stuff we're hearing about, the neural networks and large language models. So they're going back to the basics here, right? And overall, they, they had a smaller selection of patients, I believe 6,000 or so, and they identified 13 kind of key variables that influence whether or not uh, a patient you know, is going to be a good candidate for outpatient shoulder arthroplasty or should stay in. And kind of going to the previous model, the farther you get away from length of stay of zero, the harder it is to be accurate because there's just so many more variables that come into play. Most simple cases you can send home, but once you start to get into the case where should patients stay 24 hours, should they stay 36 hours, can we send them home tomorrow, we'll watch them and see, kind of like the whole observation status scenario in the ED, a lot of clinical decision making is based on the dynamic change of the patient over time. So after surgery is done, most clinicians are comfortable sending a patient home, but if they're not, this is a tool that maybe can help them understand, can they, should they keep them in longer, or is there a predictive measure that they can look at to help them decide on that? And in terms of the accuracy, you know, it, it kind of varied depending on what you looked at. I, I, I like this for its simplicity. I mean, sometimes you don't need a complex model. And even going back to the other paper, I mean, that is quite a complicated model. That's a lot of work. But at the end of the day, what it was mainly predicting off of was toward the end of the surgery, which what's happening then? Well, they're giving meds to reverse a patient. Maybe they're going through the steps of extubation. It's a little like saying, hey, I'm on an airplane. Is the plane going to land? Well, I don't know. The flaps aren't going down, and the landing gear is not down yet. So do you need something that fancy? And so I like the, the lightweight nature of it, low data collection burden. Um, <clears throat> uh, this paper uh, speaks to the paper that I talked about in the last session. Um, where you can use um, artificial intelligence to predict um, the preoperative part of the longitudinal pathway of a patient. Um, and I think something like this for uh, this kind of model would be really useful um, for any surgery, really. Um, but I don't know details about this paper. Okay. So uh, in the minutes we have left, I'm going to ask you a general question about you know, these papers that you have reviewed. And, uh, and so what's your uh, take on this paper? Because some of these, they seem more like a, an academic exercise, more than, you know, really uh, uh, attached to reality. And, uh, and so what do you think is missing and what would you like to see in uh, what's is published. I mean, this is a theme over and over again, but for example, the paper uh, that I'd presented, I mean, to even have that work, you have to have the data flowing, right? You know, the data's got to be flowing in real time, and that is not happening in hospitals right now. And so in terms of implementation, I mean, you need simpler solutions if you're going to do anything at all, because that's, that's not the state of affairs right now. Alan? I think you mentioned at the beginning how many papers were reviewed for even this session. And I think that's just a fraction of the publications oh, yeah. out there globally. And the rate of change and technology advancement is going as far outpacing our ability to keep up with, publish, and look at peer review journal articles. That's kind of the, you know, the fact that we're talking about GPT-3 on the last session, and that they're already on GPT-4 and chat GPT. And even in the paper, the author said, well, it's, it should be somewhat applicable. By the time you have published something and the next thing has already come along, it makes you know, continued research in this traditional way less effective. So I think there needs to be some kind of innovation around this, to, to crowdsource more literature, to be able to sort through 
these papers to kind of really sift through because how long did it take you to read oh, all these papers? For Vizia? <laughs> and so having, having some sort of assistive device to help you really identify the ones that are robust, applicable, and have the necessary requirements to kind of meet the, the peer review threshold would be helpful. Um, I've, I feel that these papers um, are a natural progression of what happened with every new technology. It happened to computer navigation, it happened to uh, robotics and orthopedics, and now it's happening to AI as well. There'll be this huge number of um, papers that come out in its initial few years, and then um, it'll start, the, the oscillations will start to dampen down, and then we'll have more tighter papers uh, in a couple of years' time, is my feeling. Um, I. Uh one thing that I, I'm constantly thinking about, and, and it's, it's a source of frustration, so I'll try to temper it a little bit, is that, I mean, I love science, but right now I think what's needed is better infrastructure for data, and uh, trying to get various funding organizations that specialize in science to sometimes understand that, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm beginning to get quite frustrated with it, that that's an important part of science, having the tooling, and we're missing that in our hospitals, and I don't, I don't know how to unlock that. You got any ideas? Bad data is worse than no data. <laughs> True. <laughs> That's for sure. So we've seen, uh, um, you know, during these um, day um, technologies already presented and already implemented into real world, right? And so, and, uh, and yet we still see these papers that are published. And uh, to me, they project more doubts than certainty. And uh, is this uh, what we will keep facing, you know, as, as we advance in research in, in these uh, fields, you know, more doubts will come up and, uh, and, and uh, will prevent some of this technology to be, you know, really implemented in real life? Yeah, magic, uh, machine learning is not a magic pony. It's just not, and like, again, and not to harp on the paper that I presented, but uh, you know, you look at that diagram of, oh, this is the model, holy smokes. Like, whoa, I can't possibly digest this. Uh, I don't know, just ignore those images and actually just look at the data and think about the basic stuff and there's, there's so much there. Don't get, don't get confused by looking at those diagrams. Alan? I definitely think there's continued value as technology evolves. We find ways to use technology in clinical workflows. And I think one of the biggest lessons I learned since I started learning about AI and how it applies to healthcare medicine is that although they talk about AI can replace or kind of substitute for clinicians or certain tasks that need to be done, I think ultimately it will be the clinicians that understand AI and can read papers like this and interpret the data for their own in order to decide whether or not they want to use something that will continue to push the frontiers of medicine forward. Kevin. Yeah, I think I, I want to quote what Dr. Beanie said uh, earlier. We, we, we don't know what we don't know. Sorry to paraphrase you, Stefano, but we don't know what we don't know. And it is important to have this kind of conversations and push ourselves to learn new things um, like I'm doing. <laughs> this, is, this is all new for me, but if I don't do it, um, and I will be left behind. Um, but at the same time, just being next to people that know different aspects of the same global um, scenario uh, really helps move the whole movement forward. And uh, I didn't know much about ChatGPT a few months ago, but every time I use it, every time I watch a new YouTube video on, on ChatGPT, I learn a new, new aspect to it that I've never seen before. Um, so we're all learning. Things that might not make sense to me now, might make sense to me in a, in a couple of weeks' time, or maybe never. <laughs> right. Tom, can you join us again, please? Yeah, I know. So, Tom, in uh, the minutes that we have left, I'd like you to wrap it up and uh, give you your uh, perspective on where research has to go, you know, to make sense of all of this. Well, everything has to be brought together. Um, some of these AI things are sort of uh, siloed and they're not all connected to the electronic health record or even accessible to clinicians. Uh, so in the future, they're gonna have to be more, uh, I wouldn't say ubiquitous, but uh, useful and in useful forms for people to be able to actually access them. And really, none of us know where any of this is gonna go. ChatGPT just came out a couple months ago and it 
change the whole world. And you know, it's only gonna get crazier from here on out. Thank you. Uh, please, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Very enlightening. Fabrizio, great work for putting that together. Look forward to seeing the session tomorrow as well. And now it's my, uh, my pleasure to invite to stage Kevin Plancher. Dr. Plancher is um, the principal of Plancher Orthopedics and Sport Medicine, runs the OSET conference. To many people, does not need to be introduced. But I did put you into chat GPT. So who is Kevin Plancher? He says, I'm sorry, I don't know. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> so, I love despite, it. Despite all that, it I love says, it. we're still going to go to chat GPT-5 before we can make an introduction. Kevin, you're on. Thank you. Can I have all my panelists come up, please? I'm Kevin Plancher from New York City, and we're going to do a little rumbling with robots and ASCs. So I need Nan Cord up. I need Doug Fairbanks, Scott Stewart Simpson, <laughs> Jordan uh, from Depew, Stefan Kreuzer, Michael Ass. Come on up. So I'd like to introduce... Uh, Dr. Cord it hails from Holland, and he's going to talk to you a little today about his European standalone ASC in Holland, Netherlands, and uh, we'll hear what he's going to speak about, and then we'll tell you, and then we're going to have a very big panel and something. So it's nice to meet you, Dr. Cord. The stage is yours. Start the timer. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. I think it's time for action. Now, for two days, we already heard a lot of things, and we should connect the dots. We heard about mindset change. We heard about uh, metal trays, patient engagement platforms, AI. But now, we need a field lab, because we should show that we can implement that. This is my disclosure. Um, it's not about metal. It's not about plastic but it's partly about robotics. And robotics is very important. And there is a bias, because I cannot operate anymore without any robotic arm assisted surgery. Because if I would operate without it, I wouldn't feel safe, and I cannot be sure that I can guarantee the good outcome for my clients. And the robot is not a sewing machine. It gives me a lot of data, and it has to improve my OR efficiency. And it really changes the pathway on the OR, but also the whole pathway of my clients. And I call them clients because I only treat hip and knee osteoarthritis, and those people are not sick, so they're not patients. And this is the first slide, because we're talking about an ASC. And this is the part I hate, the time. And I don't want to talk about time going faster. That's about the 1920s, the lean theory eh, from Toyota. It has to go faster, and it's all about money. And we should not talk about faster. We should talk about first better and better quality. And better quality, better efficiency, and that will lead to the financial part. I think that's very important. And the 23.9 is the hours they stay in our clinic. Every client comes in the day of surgery, and the next day, about 9.30, they are picked up. And all 2,300-plus patients went home the next day. It's all about patient expectation. So I'm sorry. It's not about an ASC, but it's an outpatient surgical center we have. And for the ladies here, my apologies, and I brought some tulips from Holland. <laughs> my name is Nanna Kort. I'm an orthopedic surgeon since 2004. Went out of the general system in 2017, and I started the clinic in 2018, thinking about, hey, is this the care I want to give? when I was in the general hospital. But most important thing is, if I need a hip or knee in 20 years, how do I want to be treated? I want the best arthroplasty, the best process, and most important, I'm not a hip or knee, I'm a person. I think that's very important. We do quite some research on PubMed, you can find it. We just published this basics in primary knee arthroplasty. We just uploaded our next book uh, about fast track. 
very nice collaboration with the European Hip Society, ACAS, and the Asian Orthopedic Society. And hopefully the next book will be the primary total knee arthroplasty. These are my young colleagues. And I think this is also important because if you want to do something new, you need ambassadors. And I have to educate the new generation. And that's important. And here you see the text, and I think that's important, that you should educate the new generation in a new way of thinking, and that's about surgery. When they came in, they were stuck to me for six months in surgery, outward clinic, everything, because it's a completely different mindset than in a general hospital. The surgery, going digital with the robotics, and normally you are 100% in the knee or the hip, now you're 60, 70% looking at the screen instead of at the hip and knee. And that's really a big change. And educating them is very important because I want a reproducible outcome. And not only the surgery itself, but also the outcome from our clients. And in our outcome, you will see that there's not a big difference between, let's say, the first thing, surgery time. And that's strange because what happens normally, and one of them was first uh, working in a hospital when he uh, uh, finished his orthopedic residency, he went directly to the OR on his own. There was no colleague. Strange. We should really educate them. What about the clinic? It's all about product leadership, operational excellence, and customer intimacy. And this is very important, customer satisfaction. It's not about the money, but it's first about our client. If we do the right stuff, the next things will follow, and in the end, the financial part. This is different than a hospital. This is our clinic, the inside. It's all open. It's like coming home. One of the nice things is a couple of weeks ago, there came back at three weeks a client, a lady. I operated her, gave her a hip or a knee. Her partner was, was with her, and he told me the story. He said, when I was driving to your clinic, and were the day of surgery, he said, I had to lock the doors closed the window because I thought she would jump out of the car. The moment I came in your clinic, she was relaxed. I was relaxed, went home relaxed. And we all know the mind has a very important influence on the outcome. So this is totally different than a hospital. And then the OR, also important. We heard yesterday, it's about a pit stop. And the Dutch guy, Max Verstappen, we're doing almost the same thing. He earns a little bit more than I do. Um, but that's important because the whole setup is different now with the robotic system. And we optimized it. And if you're in our clinic, you see that it's very efficient. But there, behind the scenes, there's a big project going on to opt really optimize that. Also, the layout of the OR. We were first in a rented situation with a small OR, with a robot in it, it was crowded. The patient came in, the client came in and said, oh gee, what a lot of people. Now it's twice as big and they say, oh nice, it's completely at ease in the OR. Very important again, the mindset for your client. And the OR is also important in all the Sets. Eh? We talked yesterday about the metal sets, medical metal trays, and that's important because it's all predicted. We know exactly in advance what kind of prosthesis, well, especially the sizes of prosthesis we are using. So our stock is very low. We have exactly the amount of trays we need. We don't have extra, so we use the metal trays because we don't want anything, eh, puncture of the, the wrapping stuff. So we all use the metal trays. Very important. And again, less disposable stuff because all the, the wrapping gives a lot of mess. What about the outpatient surgery? I started in 2009 with a PSI. I brought it from the States to, to Europe. 
did a couple of thousands of them, so I like digitalization. And the next step was the optimization of the pathway of our clients. And this is strange. I started in 2013 with the Unini. 2014, I was even on the television about that, and I was very proud because it was daycare surgery. But now I'm older, grayer, and also a little bit wise and thinking, gee, as I started, what about that faster, faster? It's not about faster, it's about better. Very important. And the nice strange thing is also, if you talk about fast track, is we know, and it's there in the literature, that all the optimization is a better outcome for our clients. And if you look around at all the settings, I think even, well, maybe 50% really implemented the fast track. Up to two years, there was a hospital in Holland where the patients stayed for five, six days. Incredible. So the know-how is there, but the implementation is not easy. And that's why I started, hey, we need action. We need to see how we can really implement all that stuff. This is a vision document of the medical specialist. It's in Dutch, very difficult, but it says, hey, we need, as a medical specialist, take action to go for the innovation of healthcare. Very important. If you look at the NHS, it's the same. Pioneering individuals eh, to adopt innovation. So I think we should be in control as orthopedic surgeons. This is the timeline of our clinic. In 2017, we did a feasibility uh, study. We bought the robotic arm assisted surgery. So you know that I don't have a Ferrari, don't have a Tesla, nothing of that. I have my Mako. Uh, the first procedure is 2018, and we were in a rented situation. In 2021, we have our own clinic, very nice, and we're increasing, increasing, and working on a second location. And the pathway is not easy, a lot of speed bumps, but we don't want to look back. We want to go for all the pieces of the puzzle. And I think that's nice of this meeting, is you hear a lot about the different pieces. And we have to put them together to optimize our client care. Some outcome. We have everything in dashboards, but I don't have to, uh, enough time to really show it in dashboards. In 2022, 800 plus procedures. 99% of the clients recommended quarter clinics. In the review side in Holland, in Holland it's from zero till 10. A 9.7, very important. And by going digital, 100% completed registration, uh, arthroplasty registration in Holland and the length of stay, as I said, 23.9 hours. And this is very important, OR efficiency. Average OR time, 42 minutes, even for my two younger colleagues. So that means that we can educate them up front and really have a reproducible outcome of the OR uh, time. Average cage duration, 64 minutes. That's really wheels in, wheels out. Average surgeon downtime, 36 minutes. Closing the wound, opening the next one, 36 minutes. 99% started on time. 71% finished on time. Some later, some earlier. And this is very important. We can do eight cases. If we do eight cases, we start at 7 a.m., and we stop an average time at 4.39 p.m. So it is possible, and at all with one OR. And that's efficiency. And what do we do? We have the ER, EMR, very important. That's really for financial stuff. We have now the EMR optimized for the orthopedic surgeon. We have the data from the robotic arm assisted surgery and the patient engagement ad platform. Patient engagement platform is really worthwhile to look into. It's a big additive value. But we have to combine the data, and this is very important. We have that in a dashboard. We combine the REST data, patient engagement platform, and the EMR. We bought a snowflake system, and we put it in the Power BI. And that gives you a lot of power. This is an algorithm that we can, it's because of time, I will skip that. 
and this is very important, is that the response rate is very high. So by going digital, we can really optimize the outcome because we give them the outcome back as showed in the patient engagement platform previously. And we're working on the interactive online questionnaire that's ongoing now within this month, it's finished. The chatbot is very important, and we cannot even talk about, because of time, the sustainability, but that's also very important. Hot topic, our clinic is when the sun shines in Holland and we have the OR running, we are energy neutral. Very important topic and very hot. Most important part is, it's the patient who decides where to go. This is the outcome, and that's where we do it for, and then we have a small video because I think it's important if we connect all the dots, we need to know what kind of dots we connect and we need what, where it's for. Thank you very much. Dr. Court, thank you. So, you'll see that we're going to have plenty of time uh, with a pretty tough panel. So, I want to bring to the stage to, uh, Mr. Fairbanks. So, of Advanced uh, Scanners, the CEO, and he's going to tell us that we're living in the dark ages, uh, because why the heck would you have a tracker? So the stage is yours. Mr. Yeah, Price. yeah, thank you, trackers. Bad, I guess. So um, I, I actually did the Doc SF conference in, at JP Morgan, and Stefano said, Doug, it's not a pitch. Don't let it be a pitch. And I said, well, I'm, I'm raising money. It needs to be a pitch. And I just broke all the rules. So for this meeting, I think the answer is that Wednesday I got funded. And so it's not going to be a pitch. I think that we'll have different goals. We'll try to entertain. We'll try to uh, inform. And maybe we'll even inspire. So uh, my name is Doug Fairbanks. I'm the CEO of a deep tech optical scanning company for use in surgical robotics. And in this uh, discussion, I think we've all heard a little bit about AI, right? And it's funny that we think about you know, all the uh, applications and reasons for AI. And I was actually uh, getting ready to do my new comp packages for my employees, because we have money now and we can pay people an appropriate amount. And I don't have an HR group, so I hired an HR group. And at the end of all their interviews, I get to sit down with them for 10 hours, which is a whole fun thing that you get to do. And the first thing out of the HR group says, hey, Doug, what's your AI strategy? Shouldn't you be an AI company? And I go, I'm sorry, what do you do here? And the truth of the matter is, is that it's ubiquitous, right? Everybody is thinking about AI. And I was sitting at my desk, and we have these two older ladies that clean the office. That is, my office is pretty similar to a garage. And I think they're somebody's relative, an employee that works at the company. And she taps on my shoulder and says, uh, Mr. Doug, don't you think you would be better as an AI company? And I said, well, thanks. Um, OK, we're not an AI company. We're a, uh, we're a 3D scanning company, and I actually like to start with an analogy because the jokes are going so terribly. <laughs> In the mid-70s and mid-80s, there was a lot of computer companies coming to market, and I tried to put together the best list I could of all the companies that were founded. Now, if you think about this list, not all these companies will make it. Some will win and some will lose, and when you think about what they gave us, you know, a lot of them showed up with this a blinking command prompt. And for many of you, this doesn't realize all the promise that computer, computing had to offer, right? And what we're really looking for was something like this, a graphic user interface, right? This is a feature set of a computer. But what it did is it allowed people to use the computer in a more meaningful way. It thought about the user. And the two companies that did this, Apple with Lisa and Microsoft with IBM, turned out to be clear winners in that field. Right? When you think about it now, a Apple's got a market cap of $2 trillion and Microsoft's $1.7 trillion. And I like that analogy because it's pretty similar to what we're experiencing right now in medicine, a time that I like to consider the greatest uh, adoption of technology in the history of medicine. And I put together a list of robotic companies. Now there's something like 150 surgical robotics companies that are either FDA cleared or about to be. And that doesn't count robot, that doesn't count navigation or AR, VR platforms or other technologies that we use in the OR. And so when you think about it, it's a very crowded field, similar to what was happening in computing. And when we think about what surgeons' intentions are, 
and what their interests are, they actually are very interested in these technologies, right? Orthopedic surgeons have something like an 89% interest rate, interest in, in using a robotic solution, while their adoption is somewhere in the, in the low 50s. And in neuro, same, same, we have parity there, 85 and, and I think 58. Now, when you think about the use case, you know, there's this very convoluted way in which the computer connects to the tissue. So we have an image in some cases and we pass it, pass, it, pass it into a computer. We use an infrared camera that uses invisible lights. We then drill into the patient and make separate holes and attach an array so that that infrared light can bounce off the field and send it back to the computer and, and make sense of the space. What really happens is there's an inferred relationship that's created between the arrays and the tissue. And that inferred relationship actually degrades over the course of the procedure. So the most accurate that you're ever gonna be in the case is at the moment in which you start registering the patient. And so my father went to go get his knee done. He got a robotic, robotic knee a couple years ago. And he said, Doug, what kind of surgeon did you send me to? And I said, what? <laughs> he said, uh, he operated on my thigh and my ankle. He couldn't find my knee. <laughs> I said, Dad, you actually went to one of the best surgeons that I could find. But uh, the reason he does that is because he has to use this, these arrays to see the computer. And it's in saying that I realized, hey, that's a really terrible experience. It's a terrible experience for the surgeon who has to go through this rigmarole to get the technology set up, but it's also a really bad experience for the patient. And anecdotally, that's one thing, but the, the documentation and the literature supports it, right? And actually, you didn't realize the FDA has actually issued a warning about using these types of technologies, that they could reduce, in, they could produce patient deaths, life-threatening injury, injuries, failed, aborted, or prolonged procedures. And that's pretty significant. And, and even worse is a frustrated surgeon. Now, I don't know how many people have been a frustrated surgeon or stood in next to a frustrated surgeon. Uh, I certainly have. And it's really terrible when they are using their eyes, pardon me, to see the patient. And what they see is different from what they see on the computer. Now, I know that some of you have had this experience. And you say, what do I even do this for? Why did I buy this system if what I'm seeing is different than what the computer sees and where's the reality in all of this, right? It's very frustrating, I assume, right? So enter computer vision. And we talked about computer vision earlier today with an incredible technology at Insight. I'm really talking about 3D computer vision. And, and as part of the education phase of this talk, I'll tell you a little bit about it. There's a couple ways you get to computer vision, 3D computer vision. One is LiDAR. LiDAR is a technology that uses a laser and it sends it out, it comes back, and we time the dif distance, and it can tell you where things are. Mostly large things and things that are moving, and this is most commonly used in like uh, automated cars, right? Very common in cars. There's another way that you get to computer vision or 3D computer vision, and it's stereography. Stereography is the concept of taking two cameras and pointing them at an object, and then using some compute in the background to say, oh, if you compare it from two different angles, you can see what size, shape, and distance is. It's very similar to the way your eyes work. When you use your eyes, it's called binocular disparity. Your brain actually does a fair amount of work to figure out how far away things are. Now, I'll tell you, this is not really popular because I like to use GIFs in my presentation and the internet didn't have any to offer. So you see how popular it is in the industry or in the world. And then there's the last kind, it's called structured light. Structured light is the idea that, hey, look, we're gonna cast a pattern into a field <clears throat> and then we're gonna use a camera to pick it up. And the way that, that that known pattern gets to form actually gives us shape and size and data about what the thing is. And this is another very popular way of doing this. And when we deform that pattern, we can actually straighten it out in the computer and we get three-dimensional structures. So what, right? Uh, how, what's future of robotics, next robotics for us, right? So, so I guess the answer is Doug is going to do something with 3D structures and 3D light to make it special for us. And, and I'll try. Here's an anterior hip. You know, we talked about our computer seeing our tissue. Here we took a camera, we shot it down this, we picked up the acetabulum and created the 3D structures, no pins. What we were able to do is to take that 3D data, overlay it with pre-operative data, 
and create a very, a very good perception of what's going on. And so this in hip, which is actually not our favorite use case, we also think about knee, right? So here we look at a knee, your eyes see the knee, why can't the computer see it, right? And in a fraction of a second, our system can get a million data points. You know, you think about trace, you, you take that wand and you rub it over the patient and you pick up maybe 300 data points in a couple of minutes. Here we get objective data that happens in the magnitudes of, of hundreds of thousands and millions of data points in a fraction of a second. Now a fraction of a second is one thing, yeah, also this is objective data, right, that is, that, that is very accurate and can check and recheck and position things in space. And it's really interesting, but you say, Doug, how does that help me get to a race, right? Get rid of a race. Well, if we can see tissue, we can tell you where it is, and that's really all, all this needs to do. And so how do you get to faster? And, and we get faster every day at a comp as, as the company get, moves through its processes. I told you that last year we were at about 1.3 times a second we could scan. In November, we were at three. Uh, January, we were at six. And then about a month ago, the engineer said 13 times a second. We need to get to frame rate 30 times a second for it to be used in a robotic system. And we think that that'll happen not within months, but in weeks, right? We're very close. And so this is an exciting technology to be used in the OR because now we can reduce cost. We talk about cost a lot. How much does an array cost? How much does it cost to put an extra hole in the patient? What is, what is the experience there, right? And so by doing that, I think we're having meaningful improvements in the way that we do procedures. Now, oh, we're at a musculoskeletal conference. I'm sorry, I did put a brain on here. There was a little bit of talk about BCI, BCI's brain-computer interface. We do do brain shift. We've solved brain shift. When the brain moves, you want to put an electrode right in the right place. Uh, Advanced Scanners does that, so I'm really excited about it. So I um, am running down on time, and I'd like to give a little bit of time back. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be here, and, and I want to draw back to Mohan's uh, conversation yesterday where he said, be an innovative thinker. That's what separates us between us and the AI. And so I want to encourage all of you to do that. And in order to be an innovative thinker, I encourage you to be passionate, right? As we stand here and think about startups and think about being innovative in our careers and in our practices and, and in our companies, I want to also encourage you to be really passionate. And, I, and my go-to for being really passionate is be passionate like the launch of Windows 95. And we got volume on this. So I'll, I'll leave you with one last thing. Be passionate like Windows 95. Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates are having a great time. If you think about this as an operating system that they launched, it's not groundbreaking, but it's really incredible. My name's Doug Fairbanks. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you today. Thank you so much. So we're gonna have a panel now for 30 minutes. I'm gonna divide it up, 15 minutes, we're gonna talk about value proposition, I'll introduce people quickly, and 15 minutes about cost. Cost about robots in the ASC. So gentlemen, there's, you got, everyone has a seat, great. So again, on the end, Dr. Cord came to us from Holland, his single uh, ASC, we'll talk about Stefan Kreuzer, is here an ASC and surgeon owner on the far right with a robotic practice. Michael Ass from Hospital Special Surgery, you heard before Michael, um, and I don't know if he's salaried, but he probably is. He's not salaried, lucky for him. Next, uh, from Depew and Vellis, and I'm gonna pronounce it, I hope right, Jeanne Dam, is that right? Stuart Simpson. George Simpson, oh, that's true. Stuart, yeah. so we're, we're missing someone. No, we are, they chose not to. Uh, oh, they chose not to participate, I am sorry. So Stuart, I apologize. From Think, recently, um, and surgical CEO, president before of Stryker, brought Mako into reality uh, for them. And you heard here from Doug Fairbanks, who was a commercial officer for J&J, &J, if you didn't know, MedTech Division. I have wonderfully conflicted human beings here on the stage, which is exactly what I want as we go through it. So, gentlemen, I would say to you that I thank you, Dr. Court. You took some of my steam away. So the question is efficiency. I've heard that all this morning. And I say to you, is our goal to make money or is it really to deliver pinnacle patient care? And so you stole that a little from this morning's thing. And I'm going to say, we have to start admitting that maybe healthcare is the most inefficient vehicle. And I don't see anything wrong with that because no two human beings are the same. 
So all of you talk about this efficiency and I want to become efficient, but don't I worry about the revision knee, the resident, the infection. And we know that robotic assisted total knees, when you talked about numbers, I give it for my audience, if you do one to 25 TKAs in a MAKO, it's about $92,000 each. You do 26 to 100, it's about 29,000. And if you do greater than 200, it goes down to about $25,000 a case. And yet you didn't worry about that. And we're going to deal with money at the end. So let's go through, since it's a value proposition for each of them, you tell me that you're going to increase precision and reducibility. So, Nan, how does Mako do that in a sentence? Well, that, it's very simple. It goes from on the eye in, to degrees and millimeters. So that's for sure more accurate than on the eye. Okay. And Doug, without trackers, can you have precision, do you think, someday and reproducibility? Yeah, it's interesting because we look at our FDA requirement of two millimeters and the PhD optical physicists that sit in my lab and make things go two millimeters, Doug. We're doing surgery at two millimeters. On the bench the other day, we we're at 250 to 350 microns, a couple of human hairs, right? And so, yeah, we can be very accurate. And without a raise, you're cutting extra cost out of the procedure. So more accurate, less cost, seems like a value proposition. So Michael, does two or three degrees matter? You know the articles out there. And so we know about longevity. So two to four degrees, they have longevity if you take a varus knee. And only when I get to nine degrees, does that implant really last as long? If I'm out, second standard deviation. Do, and I want to stay in one standard deviation. Most of us, I understand I have a CEO, two CEOs, but most surgeons were able to reduce, reduce this one standard deviation. Do I even care that I have to be within two to three degrees, or are we with terrible surgeons before? This is a concept of outliers, right? It, we can hit two to three degrees 72% of the time. So if you as a surgeon are perfectly comfortable with doing a good job on 70% of your patients, God bless you. I didn't go into medicine to mess up 30% of the time. And humans aren't perfect. The ability to use technology, and this is what technology does, it doesn't make one surgery better, right? It democratizes access to high quality surgery. Because if you do 350 knee replacements a year, you can hit within three degrees probably 85% of the time. But the average surgeon in the United States, the average number of knee replacements done per surgeon is less than 25. That's two a month. And if you can do something two times a month and be as good as somebody who does it 50 times a month, God bless you, that doesn't exist. So the reason we use technology isn't because it helps the one patient. It's because it helps all of the patients ensure they're not the three out of every 10 that we aren't as good as we think we are. And so maybe the lesson, but we'll get to it, is maybe some of these surgeons shouldn't be allowed to do the surgery, which you, we don't I, control. I wasn't allowed to say that. That wasn't the question you asked. Yes, it wasn't. So Stuart, does the doctor have any role in this machine, except, and I'm very familiar with Think and Yair and Stefan, except watching this machine go? What's your aspiration? to see Think move into the uh, stratosphere of this. And I understand we're taking robotics generally because Michael may talk about Orthline, someone may talk about Mako, but what do you think, wh where are we going with this, with your device? So we've moved on from what the, the company originally started with. We're now looking at miniaturized robots with uh, an open platform because we believe that it's a combination of technology and implants decided by the surgeon that leads to the best possible outcome for each individual patient. And a uh, <clears throat> system where the robot and the implant are not tied together um, is amortized over so many more cases, which makes it much more cost effective. So that's where we are going as a company to unlock the implant from the robot and bring choice and competition back into the market. Okay, Stefan. Why are you so excited about using an ASC robot? If, if there's so, I have to do so many cases and we know volume never makes it in big business. Anyone who's a businessman here, you never do volume. That just drives prices down. And now you're just gonna kill yourself. But why are you so excited to use the robot in your ASC? Probably, probably do drive my staff crazy because it takes... <laughs> His mic, please, go ahead. Probably do drive my staff crazy because it takes me longer to do a case now and they have to stay longer. No, but uh, my interest in robotics is really purely from one big picture. I think it, as of today, we ask 10 orthopedic surgeons on how to do a knee, we get 10 different opinions. 
So we still have not defined the target. Some people say kinematic alignment, some say mechanical alignment, some say reverse kinematic alignment, some say gap balancing. So we haven't really defined what the target is. The reason I use robotics is because I finally know where I put the implant and hopefully I can then correlate that with the outcome, which then will better define the target. So that is my, I mean, I'm more confused about knee replacement today than I was 10 years ago. You got it. So we're gonna enter a little yes, no. If they don't obey and they try to give an answer, we cut them off. So here we go, down the line. Is the role for the robot to help a resident or fellow and low volume surgeons not to make errors? For sure. Yes. 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 Good. Do you think the robot makes a surgeon a better surgeon, the reverse? Uh, yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about improved function, kinematic softball. alignment. Kevin, these Dr. are some Pini. softballs. No, I'm going to get hard. I've got to warm you up. Just say <laughs> I've sat on Try panels to be with nice. you before. It's not, you're never this okay. nice. Okay. <laughs> so can you um, lead to reduce soft tissue releases specifically with your technology? as you get through? You want yes or no? Uh, maybe, no. Maybe, yes. go ahead. Yes. It's technique dependent. Yes. If you do bone referencing, no. If you do ligament balancing, yes. So you have to understand, remember, we're dealing with Mako. I don't know where Stefan is standing, if it's Think or other technology, Navi Swiss or what. We got Mike with a little ortho line. We got Think over here, and we got no trackers. Just so you keep track of what device we're talking about out there. Reproducible alignment targets, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the whole point. Yes. Yes. Okay. So if anyone does augmented reality, do you think there's a role? You heard some talks before. Is this going to come into play now for this and supersede? No, in order. Well, I, I think that's a stop too yes, far no. yet. Uh, no. Go ahead. Not yet. I mean, the current systems are computer navigation with an augmented screen. So if you believe that computer navigation improves accuracy, then augmented reality is no different, just looks cooler. Okay. No for joint replacement, yes for spine. Uh, what Dr. Ass said. <laughs> okay. Let's clarify also outpatient surgery. So I was taught, I'm going to be mean to Dr. Court, outpatient surgery is my patients come in and four to six hours later they're out of there. There are many institutions and people on the stage professing they do outpatient surgery. Outpatient surgery is not 23 hour stay. He was honest what he does, but outpatient surgery, if you want efficiency in business, is four to six hours. I don't want to have a nurse watching me. No, not yet. Okay, Can I you answer? Can go, Michael. No? no, no this is, so this is actually a big problem we have, and we heard about this in the Doc SF Science part. We have a definition problem, and it's really hurting our research. Outpatient surgery, as defined in the United States by Medicare, is a less than 24-hour stay, is a 23-hour stay. Ambulatory surgery is what you're talking about, right. where the patient comes into the hospital and leaves on the same day. And so if you look at the papers we're writing, we need to do better. We're very specific when we talk about ambulatory versus outpatient versus neither I'll give you of a chance. And so one Europe, second. So do, so I, it's okay. So do you believe ambulatory surgery is where we're heading, Dr. Court? Yes, no? No. Okay, Stefan? Yes, no? Yes, yeah, we're, we're there, yes. So he's there, that's fair. Go ahead. Yes. So wait, no, I gotta have it. So in that hospital that will remain nameless, you believe they're now doing ambulatory surgery? So at, at Hospital for Special Surgery, they, <laughs> that will remain nameless. Right, I did not Last, name it. La last quarter, yes. we did 27% ambulatory joint replacements, 68% okay. outpatient joint replacements, no problem. I and like the rest honesty. stayed. Stuart. I'm not qualified to answer the question. You're not qualified. Would you like, as a patient, to have ambulatory surgery or outpatient surgery? I'll nail you. It's an easy yes, no. Which one would you like? Ambulatory. Ambulatory. Same. Out fast. Okay. So... Do you think it really matters what the x-ray looks like? Isn't it all about outcomes and lack of revision and patient satisfaction scores? I will give you. So you know the studies, one out of eight, 13% reported statistically significant greater improvements in PROMs with robotic-assisted TKAs. But no studies reported significant difference in revision rates. 
So tell me about that x-ray that the surgeon loves to see versus the patient comes back 25 years later and loved their result. What's your thought, Dr. Korn? I have a very nice example. I showed you the outcome of the review uh, online, and uh, that's a 9.7. Perfect. But if you look at the 700 plus reviews, there's none of them talking about my surgery. It's about the facility, getting the food, the attention. So we have to think about outcome. Should we talk about metal, plastic, alignment? In my opinion, we should look more at the mind. Stefan, your thoughts about a good x-ray versus outcomes and proms and things. Yeah, so I'm not talking about failures. Okay, right. I want to make that clear. So in, in my opinion, alignment does not matter. Cementing technique matters a lot. So if I look at an x-ray, I ignore the alignment, but I do look at the cementing technique. I'll change the question for you, Stuart. Don't get nervous. Michael, <laughs> x-rays? I mean, the, the data on the use of computers and navigation was always said that it, it doesn't affect outcomes, it doesn't affect revisions, it just makes pretty x-rays. I don't know why people keep saying that. The Australian registry and multiple studies in the United States have shown a decreased rate of revisions between 10 and 20 years when you use some type of technology versus when you don't. The younger the patient, the bigger the benefit. So in the, in the, in the 65 and under group getting total knees in the Australian registry, they had a statistic and dramatic decrease in total knee revisions when they use navigation. And remember, some of that Australian navigation is terrible navigation. This is surface navigation from 20 years ago. It was still better than not using it. So this idea that navigation doesn't affect long-term outcomes and revisions is outdated and inappropriate. It's good that he likes registries. I'm a guy that doesn't, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Stuart, so do you believe that um, the x-ray can be produced by this machine that you have to get reproducible results. Can think produce that x-ray that can produce it? It's a machine doing something. I've watched it in action. You're kind of somewhere in the other room and, and things kind of happen. So is this machine going to make it happen? Yeah, no, we've moved on from that machine, so that's no longer what we're all about. Um, okay. But a robot in general, uh, I don't care if I've, if I've had my um, ambulatory surgery. I don't care if the surgeon looks at it and says, I love the look of that x-ray. I want to know is it the right position for me as an individual patient and how do I feel during the recovery and the early return to function. Um, so I think that's where robots play a big role and okay. I will need a unicompartmental knee because I had a meniscal tear and it's starting to bother well, me. And I will do, and I will. And I you will should get have one anyway because half of the total knees should be unis anyway. So one second, going and down the Kevin's line. That's Kevin's bias in case anyone was curious. Anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to ask in one sentence and then we go on to cost because I watch time. Give me, Doug, your value proposition for why we should use robots in uh, the ASC. A value, what's value about it? Please, each yeah, of you. Yeah, value so, proposition one for, sentence. for one sentence for robots in the ASC, greater accuracy, better targeting, and a, a reduction in radiation when you use a 3D scanner in places where you need to supplement. Don't give me a run on sentence. Go ahead, yes. Better short-term outcomes and hopefully longer-term survival. Michael. Reproducibility. There you go, one word, not one sentence. There you go, Stefan. I would agree with, with uh, Michael's Michael. reproducibility, but what's probably the most important part of it is uh, appropriate planning in an ASC where you don't have the redundancy of instrumentation you know, like you have in the hospital. Dr. Kort, no. Well, I talk about ASC. Most of the surgeries are done in a hospital. Okay. So now that you've convinced me that I fully understand the value proposition, let's talk about cost, okay? Ready? How much money does a man or a woman pay to have his hair colored in New York City? Give a guess. Uh, I'm out of the hair business. I don't know. <laughs> Clearly. Give me a number. Do you know? Uh, in New York number. City? In New York City. I don't know. $75? Okay. It's 900 Okay. How much money... Stop. I'm going to show you. How much money does a lawyer in Greenwich, Connecticut get per hour? Do you know? $1,200. It's close, 900 to 1,200, well done. How much money do you receive for doing a TKR from Medicare? Uh, $1,315. At best. 
Stefan. No, that's my rate. I literally get that okay. all the that's time. It's, that's because it's safe. As you've, made, as you've made fun of me before, I'm a New York City surgeon that accepts Medicare. There you go. I know How much not money happy. does a salesperson receive for, on average for putting in the implant across the board? Per implant? Yes. It can be anywhere from 300 to $900. Implant? You believe that they cost, they, they no, get what, what? No, $3,300. No, the rep. How much does it cost to make an implant? No, the rep goes home, the company. Mm -hmm. They charge the ASC, 3,000, 4,000, 500, 200,000. What does an implant cost? Implant. Oh, I know exactly what it costs. Yeah. I know, I'm asking, how much? In, in my surgery center? Anywhere, go. Uh, 2,800. Good, so I said 3,300, whatever it is. Nan, how much money does the ASC receive to perform an uncomplicated TKR? Where, in Holland or? Go for it, come on. Uh, around 9,000 euros. Okay, US, anyone want to give? It's about, it's between 15 and 23,000 for uh -huh. a facility. How much money me. does a hospital receive to perform an uncomplicated TKR? From United Healthcare in Houston, Methodist Hospital gets paid $50,000. Great, so Stryker, you buy a Mako, it's not 1. It's not charges, payment. I got it, 1.5 million, think. 800,000, Zimmer, Rosa, 700,000, Depew, about 600,000, Smith & Nephew, about 500,000. So let's justify the use of this robot now. So you're gonna lower the OR cost, I did the articles, and it says that about for a robot assisted, let's go a total knee, it's about $354 versus $403. So I'm saving about $49. So, but there's a recovery fee of like anesthesia, supply, preoperative costs. Basically, I'm losing for a total knee about 581 in the literature per case. So everyone's worried about this value-based healthcare that isn't gonna exist. I'm a New York City guy. So it's unlike it's gonna happen. So you have two rooms, as you said, you're gonna use the one, that's fine. I'll give you the $232,400 at 400 cases in one room a year that you're losing. So your tombstone reads, he was an amazing surgeon, a lousy businessman or woman. He's now dead, but he worked hard and the family's happy, okay? And every businesswoman and businessman knows that high volume, my dad was the CFO of a big company, that volume solves nothing but lowers the price and hurts the person actually who delivers the widget. So help me now, Stefan, you're losing money, but I heard before it's gonna be good in the long term. How long do I wait before I give up on this? What's your thoughts? Well, it depends if you pay for robotics or not, and we don't. Okay. It's included so, in the implant price. So you got the machine for free? Correct. That's great. So I love it that that company does it. One second, Michael. Do you have the answer with Orthline? Because you're a little different. If so, so, so how actually, come we're all not using yours? My, my, so I work with lots of different robots and lots of different technology. My concern is really with your question. Okay. The idea of spending money and losing money are not the same thing. And my business background, I remember somebody saying, you've got to spend money to make money. Yep. And so the idea that this is being presented simply as a loss, I think is, uh, is, is sort of, and I know you're, you're you know, trying to get us in the direction, I, I love that. Keep me but moving, I, think, I got nine minutes, 45 seconds. But, but I think it is, it is up to a surgeon on how they're gonna spend their money. And you can spend your money on a bipolar sealant for blood loss, you can spend the money on whatever. If you are, if you choose, because so it's 500 where's, bucks where's of the value 20,000. Uh, I'm just saying, value, oh, so value-based healthcare is a great example, right? So the end point of value-based healthcare, which you think won't exist, and you're probably right, but, but value-based healthcare, you take the risk corridor, right? If you own that life for 15 years and you reduce one revision, how much money did you spend? How much? Yeah, how much does a revision cost? A revision, a revision on average costs about $130,000. I'm saying we need to get better without the robot. Oh, fair enough. Okay. But the point is you that spending money surgeon. and losing money aren't the same. Okay, so Stuart, is your machine out? Is the new remedy coming out? I, I want to let people know because it hasn't been. Okay, so do you think the answer is no trackers, Doug? I, I, I think it's a great answer. I think it's uh, part of our innovative nature. Okay, no so I want to just see from the audience before I go really now to the hardballs that you've asked for, whatever it is, because I'll let you. How many people are buying a Mako? Raise your hand. 
Who's buying a Mako? Here you go. If you already own one. No, who's buying a Mako, okay? Who's buying the Think? I, they need to come to you, okay? He needs a little more advertising. He just started as a CEO, in fairness. Who's buying a Rosa? Yeah, we got one of those, too. Wow. Who's buying a Velas? They didn't want to come up we on the stage. We got some Velas, okay? <laughs> who's buying a Cory? We have two of those, also. <laughs> Who doesn't want a robot? Who doesn't want a robot? We, we Chicken, all of you that didn't raise your hands. So let's sum it up. Here we go. Will you be using a robot in 10 years? Yes, no. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. No, surgeon. <laughs> no. Will you yes. be selling a robot 10 yes. years from now? Yes. Okay. If medicine is an art and a science, does the robot take away the art away? And now I've gone 10 years to learn how to be a physician, or 20 years, just to become a glorified technician. Do you think, therefore, that's going to be something that I'm excited about? I don't know. But build me the perfect robot now, 10 years from now. Is it changing or you have it in your possession? It's changing. Well, go ahead. You got the... Well, my, my hope before I retire that I'm on my boat in the Caribbean. On I my got island, that. And I'm going to just be push you. the button and the page is operated in Holland. So you want what Stuart's offering. It's a machine yeah. that, so you need to talk to him. Okay, what's your robot looking like, Stefan? We got a convert from a Mako. Go ahead. Current implants are designed to be forgiving because surgeons are not very good. We then developed robots to make them more uh, better surgeons, which we did. So in my opinion, the future is custom implants, AI-driven planning software put in with an autonomous robot. Okay. Michael, what's your robot looking like, or technology, 10 years from now? I mean, I think it's going to look like some sort of tool, because I think we will still be there. The artist is still in the room. And keep in mind, I had this amazing tour at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, sponsored by someone on this stage that will remain nameless, where the very nice person who took us around, right, that Kevin paid for, showed us that Jackson Pollock, one of the most random artists ever, was actually incredibly specific in how he did things and was very intentional. So the idea that a robot takes out the art misses the point of the art. The robot just makes us better artists and we actually create the artwork in each case that we're really trying to do. And I learned that from someone on this stage who will remain <laughs> nameless. He's being now, so evasive. Bravo. What is, what is your robot or technology going to look like as you advance it in the next <clears throat> 10 years? It will be a physician extender where the physician's artistry is all performed before the operation and the technology enables them to do many multiples of the volume that they can do as an individual without technology. And so that, vo I'll get to the second part of the question. Go ahead, Stuart. What is it, I know you're working on it and you said it. What is yours looking like? In yeah, look, maybe I'll skip the what is your question and refer back to just being a technician, right? A Formula right. One driver is not a technician of a Formula One car. That's a cutting edge machine with a cutting edge pilot or driver behind it, right? So I think the idea that you're going to press a button and it goes, no, I think that when you use a computer or robotic properly, you supplement the skills that are really good in a surgeon, the thinking, the problem solving, the feeling, the caring that is good for patients with the powers of robotics, which is calculations, measurements, very high accuracy. And so the two together, I think, create a combination that's more powerful than one on itself. Great. So will, you be, will I be making more or less money in 10 years per case? You will probably make a lot less money in 10 years. Sure. Uh, less per case, but over a much bigger volume of cases. There you go. You're killing me in my grave. I don't want to go. I couldn't care no, less the about you. No, the technology's doing all the hard work. I you're know, doing the thinking work. You're my it's administrator. Doing the, it's doing I don't the physical want to. work. <laughs> go ahead, Michael. Well, since you keep telling me I'm going to stop taking Medicare soon, I'm going to be making more money per case. But realistically, it. all of us are watching reimbursements decrease over time, and that's just a fact. Maybe it not. We just need to say no. Stefan? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to go much further. I think we've almost hit bottom. Okay. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be 800 or 700 or $600. I think we're, we're there. I, I think in Europe, in two, five years' time, every orthopedic surgeon will be employed. So he said, if you didn't hear it, that they're all going to be employed, and we think that too. Lastly, will any of these companies be in business in 10 years? You saw that big spread, and we saw two, Microsoft, many of you stole some of my things. 
Do you think that's what's going to end up happening, whatever it is? Will any of these companies be in business or will it be down to one or two? Dr. Court? No, I think at least five. Five companies, okay. Stefan? Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, I know it's hard to say, but you've got to put your limb on the line. <laughs> I live on the line. I, I hope every one of them is going to be still in business in 10 years from now because that means robotic is really moving forward. And which well, maybe one or two surpass, and then we all use it. Michael, your thoughts? I think consolidation is, is, a, is a market force that has never really changed, and I think we'll continue to see it over time. So I think, is it going to be just one or two? I don't know. Is it going to be all of the ones that we saw on that list? Probably not. I think market forces will consolidate. Uh, suppliers, just like they consolidate healthcare systems, just like they consolidate industries completely outside of what we do. Got it. So I don't believe the, um, <clears throat> the oligopoly where four companies own 85% of the market is healthy or good for the consumer or ultimately the patient. Um, the question is which one, of those, which one or two of those big four will still be here and which one or two might not. Okay. Uh, likely to have some consolidation. Consolidation. So I don't know how to sum it up, but you've heard there is some value, this proposition of precision, reproducibility um, for people. You see there's cost involved. There's a yin-yang of valued health-based healthcare that we all talk about. Michael and I live in an island, Dr. Ast, where in New York City, um, you're not a good doctor if you take insurance. That's what it's considered. Um, and so you, you spend your first 20 years, as I did, taking every insurance, and then you get out to let your junior partner take that insurance. And that's a, a different disease that we have in New York City and Manhattan. And yet, I will tell you, I ask every one of my patients, show me your tax return. If you don't have money, I'm doing it for free. So I want to go on record. And they show me their tax return. Because if you have a boat or a car in Florida, I'm in New York, I'm not listening to you, OK? Because I'm not crying for you. So, because without your health, you have no wealth, as I've always said. So these gentlemen have been very kind as I've peppered them. And so you really have to give them a big and a second round of applause. But you should know it's fun. And I am there. Maybe they're all nerds. I don't know, or computer junkies, or maybe we all are as we're learning today from Dr. Binney and letting us share some of these thoughts. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you. All right, that was awesome, uh, entertaining, fun, informative, uh, a great way to keep us all engaged. And we're going to have a quick break and come back to an equally engaging, equally exciting session this afternoon. I'm super excited about this. Um, we're going to be talking about this. Um, intersection of the innovation, the blockchain, which I think all of you are very excited about. We're going to talk about how to leverage AI, ML, and this whole piece of um, robotic process automation revenue cycle. And I'm very excited for you all to hear about uh, the complexities of how to get into the digital transformation and the, what we call the intersection layer. So thank you very, very much. We'll see you guys in about 30 minutes. Um, yeah, see you back here. Um, I am very excited about this last segment. Um, and. I encourage you to come and uh, participate. We're looking at some really critical questions from uh, blockchain, revenue cycle management, and digital transformation. And um, I have to say that I understand the excitement uh, in the other room. Everyone is chatting. It is the making the connections that DocSF is famous for making. We have an amazing audience amongst all of you, and so it's just amazing that you are meeting each other, making, forging bonds. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of companies as exhibited here wind up getting a fair um, number of contracts out of, as a result of their being here. So Mohan, welcome back We're to the to the Doxa stage. The co-founder founder of Emerge Inc. and we heard from you yesterday. It was an amazing keynote. I'm going to turn it over for you. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry I was late. I was finding the other speakers. No, thank you for doing that. So <laughs> did you find them? Yeah, I did. I found them. Excellent, excellent. We'd like to have a full uh, load of speakers exactly. coming up. Exactly. This is a very, very good session. Thank you. Well, since he's up here. Since I am here. Can you Yay. I have a lot of people help me, so thank you. I know there's a lot of people, people in the back and people in the front who do it, but he leads the charge and he suffers through the entire sessions to ensure that <laughs> works to your liking. And I think he deserves, as well as you, deserves the kind of that kind of work that's put together here. I appreciate it greatly. Thank you. It's my way of making up for being late. Um, 
So here we go. This last part of our sessions, there are a bunch of people still there. I'm trying to chase them in here. Because I think uh, the next few sessions we're going to have 15-minute rounds of conversation. And I think in conversing with them myself, I spent an hour with each one of these speakers prior to this moment to get to know them and to understand their theme and their direction. And I must tell you that I think what you will meet are four people, because there's two in one session, four people who are transformative, innovative thinkers who actually are activating what they're speaking about. And I hope you you come out of this session, this next three sessions, realizing that it is people that create ideas, not ideas finding people. So I hope you see in them people you want to follow up with, someone you want to ask more questions on. Now we have to excuse the fact that they're going to come on stage to give them a subject to kind of handle. So let me just say that the first speaker is named John Bass. John, are you here? Yep. Yes, you are. He's all ready. He's got his mic. The mic is over there. Uh, John is kind of the startup of all startups. He formulates purpose-built institutions. He's the CEO and managing director of a firm called Hash Health. He has coached several, several startups into becoming what they deserve to be. So he designs the story, the narrative is what I understand, and then he throws it together. Come on up, John, I think. Uh, welcome, John, please. Mm. Now, before he starts his uh, conversation, the shorter I spend up here, the more you see him. So just let me give a formal introduction. Besides Hash Health, he is a mountaineer, and I found out that he loves mountains, and 11 times he's climbed long? Oh, long speak. Long speak. So if you're talking about risk-taking with the right preparedness, you got a guy who knows how to do that. He's also very sentimental about it because his grandmother was the one who to kind of brought him into the idea of walking the edge of mountains. And I think you want to put this mentality into the fluidic flow of how he's going to introduce the concept, which is titled... We are talking about startups, innovation, and blockchain technologies. Exactly. And he's going to put his own flavor climbing that mountain. Please, <laughs> John. Thank you. Um, it is, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be invited back. I spoke on blockchain last year, and I'm going to give you a, an update on uh, what's happening in the space this year. I'm also going to talk about innovation generally and uh, venture studios and the venture studio model. Um, and I've, I've, uh, I've got a background, and it's, it's good to see a lot of old friends here. I, I was in the MSK space for a while, um, and I started my career at, at the Division of Trauma at Vanderbilt, and so I know enough to be dangerous about what you all do, and I'm, it's an honor and a privilege to be back with people that I, um, that I uh, think, uh, think we think alike. But, um, you know, throughout my career, I've been fortunate to be a part of a lot of different startups. Um, and I used to think I was so innovative, in, like a lot of you, like, I thought I was really innovative back in the mid-90s when I graduated from college, and I was at the Division of Trauma at Vanderbilt, and I built their first website. And then, um, a f and then a few years later, I thought I was super innovative when I was with uh, GHX, and I was traveling around teaching nurses and, 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 and hospital staff how to use the internet uh, in 1999, 2000. Um, and then about 10 years later in 2009, we started working with the, kind of a lot of the ACE demonstration sites on the early bundle payment initiatives. And I thought that was super innovative. Um, and I, I, throughout my, that career, I was always preaching about how I was saving money and reducing costs and improving care. And I, I really think I was just being cute. Um, because when across my career, Healthcare expenditures have tripled. Well, is that really innovation? Um, Ten years ago, there were zero healthcare companies in the top 20 largest uh, companies by revenue. Now there are eight, and there are all these big pipeline businesses. You know, in a in a, you've got Apple and Microsoft, and you know a bunch of platform businesses and technology companies, and you have these healthcare behemoths that are all old pipeline kind of dinosaur business models that are just crushing it. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest of those is CVS, and they make 60% of their revenue uh, off their PBM. 
And so that's what innovation's been doing the la throughout my career. Innovation, if you talk to Clayton Christensen, it's about, you know, what's been happening is we've been building sustaining innovations and we've been building uh, efficiencies that are all driving profits towards these large uh, organizations. Um, and Christensen would say that at some point, there, these, these, I think, and I think we're seeing it, the urgent imperatives are changing the basis of competition. I think you're seeing competition changing in a lot of different ways, and it's driving stakeholders to look at new strategies and business models and innovation capabilities. And what we're seeing is that lots and lots of venture capital organizations, lots and lots of enterprises are all trying to get good at early stage product development now. Um, and the venture studio model that we've adopted is now expanding to more and more types of organizations. Um, and I, um, I think that's a trend that you'll see continue to accelerate. Um, I, I think we've got basically three problems. One is healthcare innovation seems like this kind of $4 trillion game of whack-a-mole. You, you kind of knock out costs in one area and then it just pops up in another area. Um, we optimize for zero resistance. Is it really, you know, like, innovation these days is like, you, you optimize it to, to disrupt and make it as easy as possible to implement. Instead of optimizing for stress and learning and true innovation, you're optimizing for like zero resistance. And also, the third problem is I don't think we think weird enough. Um, throughout my career, I've kind of moved down this spectrum of weirdness. Uh, our, our research team at Hashed Health, is, this is a very scientific uh, study that we've done that scales weird to not weird, and some works kind of somewhere in the middle. This is kind of the Web3 and blockchain people down here, and then that's your typical healthcare company over at the other end. Um, when I talk about weird, here's what I mean. You, your organizations, do you innovate in ways that reinforce the status quo? Do you innovate based off of design patterns that are working for your organizations? Most companies do. Or do you, are you open to failure? How does your management team, your leadership team handle failure? Um, do you optimize for challenging assumptions and challenging traditional business patterns instead of relying on them. Are you playing conservatively or are you playing to win? I've spent the last six years working on blockchain and Web3 and healthcare, and there's nothing weirder than that. I've spent the last two years innovating around the venture studio model in healthcare. And I'm gonna tell you kind of what I know. Now, this is gonna be fast. It's, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna move pretty quick. Web3, is about the ownership of digital assets. And we think about kind of these four different things when we talk about blockchain and Web3. We talk about the technology blockchains, we talk about digital assets, we talk about DAOs or um, decentralized autonomous organizations, we talk about the metaverse. Blockchains are good at proving the ownership of digital assets. And if there's one thing that you remember, it's that. It's about the ownership of digital assets. In, a, in an increasingly digital world, blockchain Web3 is about the ownership of the things that are, that are tokenized or digitized in that world. Do you want to own things in virtual environments, in digital environments? It, the blockchain is how you do that. Or if you, if you don't have the blockchain, then you're trusting a centralized organization uh, with your the ownership of your assets. So um, the value proposition of blockchains are trust, transparency, and incentive alignment. And it enables you to move these assets programmatically. And I'll talk about that more in just a minute. And blockchains are credibly neutral, and they make commitments. And so these are important things in a healthcare environment where you've got all these value chains that are um, that suffer from issues related to trust and transparency and incentive alignment, uh, you know, supply chains, uh, what we did at GHX. You got big organizations that sit in the middle of those value chains and soak up a lot of value. Um, we talked about the PBM a minute ago. Um, you've got 
you know, if there were any, any industry that could benefit from things like community ownership and uh, open innovation, it's, it's healthcare. We talk about the second thing is digital assets. Digital assets can be what, fungible or non-fungible. Fungible assets are things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and stable coins and central bank digital currencies. Non-fungible tokens are things like art, music, claims moving through a claims life cycle, patients moving through an episode of care, um, supplies moving through a supply chain. These are unique digital assets that can be tracked, on, the state of those assets can be tracked on a blockchain by a network of organizations who all care about what is true about the state of that digital asset. Digital assets are held in wallets on your phone and they, or on a, another device, but, and they can be programmed. The movement of those assets can be programmed. So these digital assets, you can program what happens when they change their state. I'm going to keep moving here. DAOs are community-owned autonomous organizations that are, it's basically a group of people or a group of enterprises that are all sharing a treasury and aligned around a common cause. They're all interested in the state of a patient moving through an episode of care or some digital asset that's being traded, tracked on a blockchain. Crypto, over the last 10 years, um, starting with Bitcoin, um, is the fastest rate of adoption of any technology in human history. And so there's a lot of pressure on crypto lately, but I, I don't think that general trend is going to, to, to change. Now let's talk about Venture Studios for a quick, and then we'll bring these things together. Venture Studios, like what we do at Hashed, are innovating innovation. And what I mean by that is we use a process for building startups that focus on kind of an iterative, intentional series of activities that are designed to maximize the value of the startup and de-risk failure. And so we spend about, when we bring an idea into our process, we spend about three months validating that idea. Um, we do business architecture, technical architecture, lots and lots of customer interviews. We start looking for who's the type of person that would run the company, and then it, it about, at some point, once we've kind of validated and, and kind of assessed all the risk, um, the technical risk, business risk, usability risk, all the different types of risk, and we feel good about, like, we know what we're doing, we'll switch into delivery mode, and we'll start spending real money in real time, first prototyping a product, then building a product, recruiting a co-founder, recruiting customers, recruiting investors, and doing all the legal and formation work to stand up a new company. So by the time we spin something out, We've done everything we can to de-risk that, um, that company. And if you follow that process, the data tells you that you're faster to seed, faster to A, and you got a better internal rate of return and better TVPI. The metrics are clearly superior to startups which fail 90% of the time and enterprise innovation activities that only are successful 25% of the time. Now, so that's what studios do. So I've talked about blockchain, I've talked about studios, and now I'm gonna tell you about some of the startup trends that are going through our process. And so here are the design patterns that we focus on. Now, I will tell you of our, for example, of the seven companies that are in Hashed Health's process currently, two are blockchain, and the rest are what I would call blockchain inspired. You don't always need a blockchain to optimize for trust and transparency and incentive alignment. We only use that technology when it provides a clear differentiating value in a, in a unique business model, especially in a B2B environment where people generally know and trust each other. You don't always need a blockchain to, to, create, a, to create a solution that fits one of these design patterns. So the, these are the design patterns we focus on. Communities and community curated data we do a lot of exchanges in marketplaces. We do a lot of programmable value transfer work, which means um, we, you can pr start to program the movement of, of money and assets across a network. And we're starting to do a lot of work around token gating, which is where we use a non-fungible token that represents access to certain information by the community. And I can talk, I might have time to, 
I'm going to hit some highlights here. I don't know if I'll have time to talk about all of this, but um, I'll be available after the, after the meeting here uh, for any questions. Um, so let's talk about one design pattern around communities. Um, we have a couple startups. One is called um, uh, Peer Supply that's bringing together communities of suppliers and providers to um, focus initially on resiliency across that. So there are basically the members of this network, which represent about 35% of the provider world, are all starting to share information with each other on this exchange um, in order to uh, create um, business continuity and resiliency um, uh, initiatives. So how do we start to work as a community to understand critical items, um, equivalencies for those items that might go on back order and back order uh, information across the network? So that's one example of uh, a community, bringing together uh, a community of organizations who are all generating data and are now sharing that data with each other in a community database in order to get smarter about efficiency and business, uh, resiliency and business continuity. Another startup we have in this area is called SubPop, and basically it's bringing together self-insured employers into a community to improve how they source and contract for the benefits for their employees. So again, bringing together a group, bunch of organizations whose HR departments really are terrible about sourcing benefits for their employees, how do they get smart together, how they share information with each other, and how do they um, kind of get together around the sourcing and contracting and the outcomes of the benefits for their employees. So this is a trend um, that we are very focused on around bringing together communities to solve shared problems. Um, there are a couple other examples I can share with you after this uh, that also um, kind of fit in some of these, especially exchange in mar as in exchanges in marketplaces um, category. So unfortunately, we're out of time. I think the, the, the kind of final point I'll leave you with here is that blockchain, Web3, and kind of this Michael Porter shared value creation concept allows us to start thinking about bringing together important technical, social, and economic um, forces into the solutions that we create. And so how do you start to fuse together and create a new, uh, but how do you th fuse these things together and create a new improved relationship between commerce and care? And I hope we get it right because this is critically important. Um, happy to stick around and answer any questions that you have after the, after the conference. Thanks everybody. Thank you, thank you, John. Uh, he has a series of, of thought patterns that I think if you want to interview him later, it would be really helpful. He's, he's deep in thinking about, like I want to ask questions all over the place. Like you're talking about transparency, you're talking about shared ideology, and you're talking about trust. That's not, we're not famous for that in this industry. So how do you impose that technology that enables trust and enables shared technology as well as transparency in a system that doesn't allow for that. I'm like really curious, so I'll, I'll ask you that when we have a next time together. Our next speaker is gonna have 15 minutes with you as well. There are two individuals, two people I've, I've shared some time with, Nadir Sami and TJ Rock, who should be in a rock band. I mean, I hope you have a rock band. Um, Nadir is the CEO and, uh, and TJ is, is the CIO. They're going to be discussing issues that are very close to their work, which is the revenue cycle of the future. And of course, we have to say leveraging AI and robotics and ML, but I think technically they are experienced in this area and they fundamentally tried to understand it enough to explain it to us in, in late terms. Uh, fastest growing revenue cycle management company uh, and obviously aware, Nadil's been around for, since 2000 working on this area and now is expressing it in a company that he is part of. Please welcome the two of them and let's have them have a conversation with you about that. Thank you, Mohan. Appreciate it. Um, so we'll kind of skip, we got intros for Mohan, so we'll leave it at that, given the 15 minutes, just kind of quickly here just so you kind of understand our perspective 
on what and what we see in the revenue cycle arena. Um, <clears throat> we have um, about 1,100 surgical clients, ASCs, and surgical practices around the country. Uh, we've collected over about $10 billion for our clients and submitted about 25 million uh, charts that we've coded. So, you know, we, we have significant data, significant information. We see what's kind of happening around the country. So we're in, I think, 48 states um, <clears throat> right now. And TJ, who is our CIO, will talk. Uh, he's got an IT department of 70 people in our organization. We have about 1,500 people. Um, and 40 of his, uh, 40 people on his team are focused on uh, automation, software development, and such. So um, we're all relevant to the to, to this, these couple days in discussion. I'm just going to spend a second. I don't know how much people in this audience understand about revenue cycle, but it's. I just want to level set it so that as we explain what's happening uh, from an automation perspective. Uh, so really, to kind of start, there's so managed care contract negotiations, front end services, which would be everything from scheduling, registration, pre auth, uh, insurance verification types of functions. Then next, the medical coding process, the submission of claims, the creation of the submission of, and then the management of the accounting functions of the healthcare claim. Um, and then the AR appeals process, denial management, et cetera, and then everything related to the patient as it relates to their claim as well. Um, and then finally, how you pull it all together from a reporting and analytics perspective. So all of those pieces are all relevant to the discussion today. So the challenge or problem facing revenue cycle has historically has been, and still today, is very labor intensive, uh, labor intensive business. So it requires a lot of people in your back office to get work done, to get your claims out the door, to manage the money that you need to manage, to generate the cash flow you need to keep your, your practice, your ASC healthy. Um, and so with any labor intensive process and where there's human beings doing work, the only certainty you have is that there will be human error in the process. And so there's studies, recent studies, that show $200 billion of money left on the table by healthcare providers on an annual basis. We see it every single day. We audit groups across the country, the amount of dollars left on the table through, and it's, and it's by design. Payers are quite um, impressive in their techniques and tactics that they have, have put up and the obstacles they've put up that make it difficult um, to collect on those dollars. So. Uh, the more that you can do with technology, the more you can automate and reduce the human element is really important, and the world is moving very aggressively in that direction. Um, but just an example, a couple examples on the, the, the types of impact that what could cause dollars to be left on the table like that. So think about, you know, you're doing a, a total knee and your payer contract requires it to be pre auth and someone makes a mistake and they pre auth the wrong thing where they don't pre out that you just, now you got a $15,000 payment that you could have received that you're not going to get. You spent $4,000 plus on your implant um, that you've spent hard dollars out and you're not going to get it and the payer's not going to, they're not going to budge on that. Um, <clears throat> same thing, ver insurance verification. You make a mistake with that and human, you know, again, human, human being, hourly employee, back office makes a mistake. You've left significant dollars on the table. Denial management, this is, this, you know, as you guys know, only industry where you provide a service, but you didn't properly bill somebody on time and you lose the ability to invoice them later. So you submit a claim, it gets denied, you might have 90 days to properly submit your appeal. And if you don't do it, then now it's a timely appeal issue and you, you've lost your right to those dollars. So. There's a reason why, again, the industry set up that way and why big dollars are being left on the table. So the, again, back to the point, just kind of setting the stage for the, the, the importance of technology and automation and machine learning, RPA, and, and AI in this space. So I'm gonna kind of jump ahead here, but you know, we all know labor has, you know, labor challenges over the last couple of years, high costs, high turnover, um, all of those types of issues are creating problems. Um, and so the more that you can, again, uh, invest in and, and focus on technology that will help you is significant. So there have been technologies that have evolved over the years that have helped with this process. For example, submission of claims. There's, an, there's a way to automate that, which we would do and we do. 
your ERAs come in, it can auto post payments. Claims auto statusing is kind of a, that's newer in the last few years, five years maybe, where instead of, you know, we had done studies where 30 to 40% of the time of our, of our staff was spent statusing claims. You're going out on, online, checking Blue Cross Blue Shield United, you know, what's the status of the claim, coming in, posting a note. So you can now automate that where the, you can have these bots and the bots go out to, the, to, the, to those sites, pull the information, automatically put it in, put it in your system, now you've taken that work away and automated it. So, so those are some things that have definitely helped the industry evolve, but now we're at that stage where, again, ML, RPA, and AI is really starting to emerge in a big way. And uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to TJ, who's gonna dive into more depth on all of this. Thank you, Nader. I'll do the clicker. Okay, I'm not going to bore everyone with defining this right now, but we will talk about RPA for a quick second. Uh, what I'll say is uh, I thought when I got the National Medical eight years ago, it would take me 12 to 18 months to solve all of the problems, and then I would move on to something else. Uh, I vastly underestimated how complicated revenue cycle is. It's highly repetitive work that also requires a tremendous amount of knowledge, uh, and that's why uh, these emerging technologies uh, are going to be game changers. Uh, so we'll come to some other AI-driven technologies in a second, but for those who aren't aware, RPA is just the ability to automate manual processes with software. Uh, that's a real simple way of putting it. Uh, but because it's such a manual uh, process, uh, you, you need this piece. Uh, as everyone's aware, there's massive interoperability issues in healthcare. So you have different systems, they have different kinds of data. Uh, RPA is the fastest way to bridge those gaps without people having to invest too much in their technology. Uh, NLP, pretty straightforward. This is just a computer's ability to either understand, interpret, or write uh, in a language that we can understand. And so then we're going to talk about something that I think a lot of folks might be aware of. Uh, Computer-assisted coding. So this uses natural language and machine learning. The idea here is after uh, the ML gets trained in by a certified medical coder, uh, the ML should start being able to accurately predict or code the charts themselves, uh, usually in a supervised manner. So it's more reading an operation, an op note, and then suggesting codes, and then a certified medical coder will approve or uh, disapprove of its coding, um, and then that goes back and trains the data set uh, in the hopes that uh, in the future, uh, other op notes uh, can be coded faster uh, by the computer-assisted coding. Coders, uh, it, we, we work in an industry where uh, coders are a little hard to find. A lot of them are aging out. Uh, so this is something that has to be automated. And from what we've seen in the space, it, it's really close. So I, I don't know if it solves the problem completely yet. Uh, but I think it will very soon. Uh, so I think that's just, there's a lot of vendors offering solutions. Uh, they all have different strengths and weaknesses, but uh, it's something to definitely keep an eye on. Okay, this is when it starts getting really cool. Uh, so we talked about the RPA, right? That's a quick ability to automate a manual process. Uh, one of the limitations with RPA as it stands alone is systems change. Uh, they get updates. Um, uh, a login button might move or a, a connection methodology might change. If you have machine learning in the background of the RPA, then you can actually have the RPA report back the error it's having to the machine learning, which should help auto-correct the error it's having in its automation. So put a different way, if the RPA is supposed to say, post charges in this system and then submit a claim, and then the vendor of your practice management system makes a massive update, you still have to invest time with a pure RPA solution for an engineer to go in and retrain the RPA. There are technologies now that have married these two solutions very successfully so that when the RPA breaks, the machine learning allows it to relearn its automation without human intervention. This is actually a massive leap, um, and this is going to make it a lot easier especially the more systems you have to integrate with. 
uh, for you to automate a lot of these processes. Okay, so this is another one that's very cool, uh, conversation analytics. Uh, so uh, two other areas in RevCycle that are very important, uh, AR reps talking to payers and patient account reps talking to patients. We would love to think that every AR rep and every patient account rep says all of the right things all of the time and has a, a good outcome, but that's just simply not the case. There are several technologies, and a lot of them aren't even healthcare specific. Um, there are te several vendors uh, that are solving this problem, uh, and it's very impressive what it does. Converts the entire conversation to text for machine learning to then evaluate the call uh, provide a disposition of the call, and even coach the rep in real time while they're on the phone. So if, it's, if the uh, machine learning is starting to uh, assume that, say, the patient is upset, then these uh, technologies will politely make suggestions to your rep to maybe change the subject or use different language. Uh, and it's an excellent auditing tool, uh, and it's an excellent real-time training tool. Uh, but it also just gives you a nice, fast way uh, to see the performance of your patient account reps instead of hoping and assuming they're not saying anything that you wouldn't want them to say to your patients. And having listened to a few recorded calls, there are definitely things patient account reps can say you don't want them saying to your patients. Okay, so uh, generative AI is just AI that can create something new from the data it has, has read about. And, I'm gonna show a real obvious example here in a minute that everybody's probably very well aware of. Uh, okay, so voice RPA. This is very new, and there are vendors out there demoing right now, and it's very impressive. Voice RPA is a bot that sounds like a person that calls the payer and fights with the payer to overturn a denial. It's amazing. Um, I haven't seen it at scale yet, right? So I'm seeing, uh, small snippets of it being successful. So I can't say we can deploy it tomorrow and you don't have to hire an AR rep ever again. But uh, it's working, it's real, and we'll see, we'll see how successful uh, it gets. But it's, it's very neat, so I'm gonna move on. Okay, uh, I'm actually asked for a show of hands on this one. Who has heard of ChatGPT? <laughs> right, okay, I figured. Lots of different fun demos out there on the internet of people talking to ChatGPT, asking it to you know, write a poem about baseball and the voice of Shakespeare, lots of really cool stuff. The very first thing I did was get with a medical coder and started asking it revenue cycle questions. And we were actually really impressed with the answers. You can't just take it and run with it, it's not perfect, the coder had all sorts of suggestions for why this is pretty good advice, but not great. But considering this is in beta, it's brand new. I don't know, I, none of us fully know the data set they fed this thing, but medical billing in the ASC space, that shocked us. So I'm just showing a couple of the questions that we asked it. What's that? Right, this is, uh, for anybody that can't see it, this is a question of, was the CPT for a rotator cuff repair? And it came back with uh, 298, or yeah, 29827, I'm not a coder, 29827. Uh, and then it goes and gives all the context and qualifiers just to make sure you don't actually use it. Um, our coder liked it, gave multiple options, which I might not have brought them all in this uh, screenshot. And then I think there was one more that we, we really liked. Okay, she asked it a trick question. Uh, so, uh, asked, uh, how is a 10x procedure of the elbow coded? Uh, this is an unlisted procedure. And so, that was something our coder was completely blown away by. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the last one. I also asked it to uh, write me a 15 minute PowerPoint presentation about AI and RevCycle, but it didn't do it. Uh, so we had to do this one ourselves. Um, anyway, uh, I thought this would be cool to end on because we've all heard of it, and even this has a practical application already in RevCycle. Uh, so that's about it.
Are you feeling a little agitated? Well, you should because it's agitating. Um, what it did was it actually, if you know the algorithms, and I don't, but I, am, I have a hunch, it's really a lexical scan on all the words. It's really not understanding what you're asking. It's just copying the words by probability on a neural net, and it's running 172 billion parameters at the same time and coming up with that language. And you're looking at it and saying, that's really smart. Well, it's really stupid. But it's smarter than you because it can do it. So it's not about who runs faster. It's the bear is still after you. And at this point, it'll catch you first. So when you have this kind of capability, the question to ask yourself is, now, I, I worked in the insurer for 20 years. So I was in the innovation side on the other end of this battlefield. But imagine what will happen now, right? You'll have machines finding the most opportunistic way to file claims for you so they can get through the walls. And then on the other side, you'll see insurance companies developing same machinery that's going to block it because if you're doing weird stuff, it's going to trap you. So this is the new battlefield, right? When you have discontinuous relationships between the value chain, which we do, right? We talked about that. And you don't have a trust network, what do you have? You have building up of new capacity to kind of block each other. And that's going to be an interesting robot battle that you will observe in the next few years. You'll file five claims per second, and the other one will shut down 10 claims per second in an attempt to find logic in the relationship. And then you'll send a robot to go yell at that person, and then there'll be another robot that's accepting the yelling, and you'll have discontinuous, right? And when you say GPT is not angry, it'll get angry. Once it documents all this, it will act in a ferocious way, which is going to be interesting to see. So we have a giant mirror that reflects our ugliness and our charm. That giant mirror, don't break the mirror. You got to change, right? It's not the mirror that's the problem. But hey, we're going to break mirrors all day. Next speaker up, 15 minutes. Uh, I'm enjoying this because the three, the three teams that have come to see you are exciting human beings. It's Anne Sujacha, thank you for being here. She's the chief growth officer um, and a partner for Decimal Health. By the way, I love that title, Decimal Health. It's got a great tone to it. Her subject matter is, going in a bit, is titled Integration Layer. What is it? Why should it care? And in speaking with Anne, I mean, this lady is prolific in her, re her connecting of the dots. When I was speaking with her, time flew very fast. And she was relating so many different concepts that only an aficionado can understand. And I want you to enjoy her company for the next 15 minutes. Uh, oh, I need the clicker. This is true. All right. Oh, thank you. I am the thing that is standing between you and the bar. Um, and uh, shutting this down, but um, I am a professed uh, digital health addict. I've been in uh, digital health for about 20 years, bringing a lot of different and novel concepts from even STARS ratings and um, physician online appointment scheduling to um, MIPS workflows inside of uh, the EHRs and platforms and have had the pleasure of uh, working for some interesting companies, including the advisory board company where I was the VP of uh, digital healthcare consumerism, and then working inside of Optum, um, where admittedly I ran screaming after. Um, but nonetheless, uh, digital therapeutics and what are digital therapeutics? Um, how many are familiar with that at all in the term of digital therapeutics? Okay, so not that as many as I had hoped, but. Um, the digital therapeutic in a nutshell is software that provides a therapeutic benefit. Um, it is meant to be stood up independently and be able to manage and treat a disorder or disease, and it's ultimately really a companion for patients when they are not with their physicians, right? The physician can't be with the patient all of the time, and there is a great opportunity for these digital therapeutics to ultimately hold the hand of the patient and be able to treat. Now, there's a big distinction between digital health and getting all the way to the top of the pyramid of being a digital therapeutic. Um, you can imagine the differentiation between a software that says, I can help you sleep, and a software that is capable of saying, I treat your um, chronic illness and disease, and in fact, you know, I can help with your, uh, uh, for instance, um, 
uh, anything to do with uh, psychological or depressive, depressive disorders, or um, I can actually treat your insomnia. Um, Somhurst is actually one of the really good examples of a digital therapeutic that needed to be prescribed by doctors. Um, unfortunately, Pair Therapeutics has filed bankruptcy <laughs> and is actually going to be uh, in auction next week um, and $50 million uh, in the hole. So it's uh, early days in, in the infancy of digital therapeutics, but you know, we're uh, ultimately kind of seeing what's happening. What is going on right now, though, is ultimately they have not quite figured out the appropriate business model for it yet. So in terms of the emergent and rapid growth of digital therapeutics, there's been over 40 FDA-approved digital therapeutics. Um, it's increased tenfold in the last five years. In terms of oh, my orthopedics in particular, we see um, a lot of tools that are specific around chronic pain management. Um, again, Pear did have a solution that was treating that. Uh, you see tools like Kaya. Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, heard or seen any of those, but ultimately, you know, this market is growing dramatically. I think it was certainly fueled by a little bit of the bubble that we've had in healthcare for the past few years and all of the VC money that has certainly flown into the market. And I think Pear definitely put everybody on its heels a little bit. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, this rapid growth is definitely out there. The problem is, is, you know, it's running into the wall and that wall is physician adoption. It continues to remain low, largely because of burnout, workflow efficiencies that are not really um, easy for the doctor to be able to prescribe these. Um, it needs simplicity in the documentation. Um, the physicians are already spending too much time in their EHRs in terms of the bells and the whistles that are going off with the 50 plus digital therapeutics that are out there. They're not 100% sure what they should be writing. It takes a lot of time too for the doctors to actually be able to sit down and train and understand these therapeutics, let alone get their patients onboarded to them. Um, and physicians aren't really sure on what their role should be when it talks, you know, or when it comes to implementing digital therapeutics. Um, you know, a lot of organizations and AMCs right now are looking to validate the outcomes of digital therapeutics. In fact, I've got a few, if anybody's interested, um, that, are, that are looking to create some of these clinical trials. But it's a little bit sad and depressing, and it may all drive us to want to get a drink after this, but, you know, there's been less than 4% of physicians actually utilizing digital health tools and digital therapeutics, and the increase has only been 1.6% over the past seven years. So the good news is, is we actually conducted a study um, of digital therapeutics, and uh, what we found was very interesting, and that's that the majority of doctors, over 80%, would actually like to prescribe a digital therapeutic. Um, and, you know, out of the physicians that we surveyed, you know, I think we had a little bit of a robust response that 25% of them had actually already tried to prescribe, and I think that was the nature of the audience of the uh, uh, survey in general. But, um, you know, the reason why providers are wanting to prescribe DTX is because there's inadequate existing treatment options. They've been shown to have great clinical efficacy, and really, patients are looking for something else other than a pill sometimes. Um, the problem is, is that it takes a lot of money and a lot of effort to ultimately get and become a digital therapeutic at a prescription level. Uh, FDA status and breakthrough status on some of these uh, DTXs is incredibly complicated and incredibly you know, time consuming. And I think that there is you know, a long road ahead of us in terms of really being able to get these approved and get them out there. Right now, I would say pharmaceutical companies are kind of the best equipped to help augment digital therapeutics. A lot of the digital therapeutics will have a molecule on top of them that can help with um, you know, med med adherence, endurance, uh, getting patients through side effects. But you're seeing pharmaceutical companies used to kind of the longer trajectory and the clinical trials and the path that is ultimately needed to get digital therapeutic adoption. But, you know, we are seeing a few of these standalone. 
Um, unfortunately, the runway is ultimately running out. Um, the thing that I find the most interesting about orthopedics in general and the opportunity in orthopedics for digital therapeutics is RTM codes. Um, when you look at digital therapeutics, one of the things that paratherapeutics did was have a HexPex code. HexPex codes don't really benefit doctors. They're, why would they spend the time? Why are they going to be interested in actually writing these? But RTM codes, which were just released by CMS in 2022, do give the physician some opportunity to have incentive to actually take charge and learn about digital therapeutics and be able to write them. The thing about the RTM codes, though, is they were specifically set up for physical therapists and physical medicine. So what's nice is, I don't know how many of you are familiar with RPM codes, but RPM codes came out in 2019. Um, they didn't have built-in coaches, so to speak, that could actually sit and observe all of the data that uh, the devices and everything was spitting up. With orthopedics and with physical therapists and RTM, you've actually got a built-in coach in many cases. So that is one of the nice things that actually may help with the adoption of remote therapeutic monitoring. Right now, though, we see about $160 on average that can be um, utilized and you know, build with these CMS codes, um, our CPT codes. But you know, what's tricky is that it is with CMS. And so one of the things that we're actually anticipating is that it may take a while to get some of the adoption. They just were released last year. Um, in terms of RPM, I always like to use RPM a little bit as a proxy of what we may see with RTM and differentiate between the two. But remote patient monitoring referred to the use of digital technologies capturing and analyzing patients' physiologic data. So blood pressure cuffs, scales, all of the uh, glucose monitors, uh, pulse ox were all used heavily with RPM. RPM um, in particular saw a little bit of a lift, and I'll go into some of those numbers. But in terms of RTM and where it differentiates, these codes are used to capture and analyze outcomes for a therapeutic response in the patient and adherence to a treatment. So they're specifically designed for musculoskeletal, cognitive behavioral therapy, and then respiratory therapy. So clinicians are able to review the data, make sure the patient stayed and adhered to the regimen, and ultimately in the review of that data be able to bill and be able to um, receive you know, some monies for that RTM code. Very different from RPM, where they have to review ultimately all of this physiologic data that's taken in by the devices uh, as well. But when we look at RPM uptake by providers since 2019, and again, I want to use this as a proxy, less than 5,000 HCPs utilized RPM in 2019. And it was specifically for Medicare patients in particular, because of course they were initially CMS codes. It took some time. It took about a year of bombarding the commercial insurers with these codes that they finally began to reimburse them and adopt them in 2021, of course, additionally under the duress of the pandemic. Um, so commercial players began to adopt, and since then, we've seen a nice CAGR, and about 8,000 HCPs have written and are uh, billed for uh, the CPT codes for RPM since, uh, since 2021. So, um, still not the best uptake, I think, but we're getting there and it is definitely getting better. Um, when we look at, you know, the marketplace and because these RTM codes have come out, what we're seeing is certainly a rush and a rush to the market of companies and playing in this virtual care model with PT there's a combination of solutions that are out there. So we've got visiting physical therapists that you guys might be familiar with or used to. Of course, good old Fox will go to your house and uh, do the physical therapy treatments. Um, additionally, you've got some hybrid scenarios with organizations like Luna and Kaya. Now, Luna and Kaya are digital therapeutics that have gone directly to the payer as well as the employer and are able to asynchronously treat the patient with a digital therapeutic in conjunction with a PT that can go to the house or teach these patients you know, how to do these exercises, treat their chronic pain, and actually hopefully reduce the opportunity to need to go to visit a physician. So it's a interesting model. They haven't quite figured out you know, 
what they're going to do here. Um, in my experience in working with the payers in Optum, what I found is they would often be more than happy to give these startup companies their very complex and difficult population to try and treat. We're still waiting for the long-term outcomes to see whether or not it's going to be successful. Um, but they've had significant uptake because the payers are willing to give Luna and Kaya um, a leg up in terms of marketing directly to the patient through their employer too and getting them to use some of these devices. Um, there are organizations like Kins. Kins is a really interesting model. It's a redesigned health company. Um, they actually have a hybrid asynchronous approach where they bill under an AMC or a health systems tin. So they're able to use um, the negotiated rates with the health system, but ultimately have what I would call like the Uber of physical therapy, where they have on-demand physical therapists that will go into the patient's house, asynchronously treat them you know, from telemedicine visits as well, but really truly be an extension of the hospital and you know, allow for um, reduction in leakage. They can play both sides of the fence too in a fee-for-service or a value-based care world. So in looking at a lot of the models, I like their model because I think um, there's good uptake. Uh, additionally, you see a ton of software-only solutions. Um, there's been a rapid investment. Again, as soon as an RTM code comes out, you're seeing a lot of companies enter that space um, where they're simply able to provide physical therapy and exercise regimens for the patient, and then it's a path to billing. Um, this, to me, gets a little bit tricky and almost a little bit of a race to the bottom, unless, of course, they're able to go for something. It, it, much like RPM, you saw hundreds and hundreds of RPM companies come out. Um, you're now seeing consolidation. You're seeing roll-ups. You're seeing a lot of them go out of business, too, um, in terms of the model. But nonetheless, there is a lot of activity in the orthopedic space for software-only solutions providing physical therapy. Um, Hinge and Sword Health are pretty interesting because they're true hybrids in that they have actual devices that help measure the physiologic movements of the patients. So they can bill for RPM, RTM, and then additionally, they're actually, in many cases, to a digital therapeutic. So when I look at orthopedics, um, it's actually the one specialty that has the most opportunity and most momentum in the digital therapeutic and RPM and RTM space. Um, I don't think that's uh, by mistake and design. I think orthopedics has a tendency to be a lot more progressive and advanced, but uh, there's, a, there's a big opportunity here. I would say additionally, there's the hardware dependent only therapeutics, like Exor Health is VR. So they're able to do um, physical therapy through using VR and doing some of the movements that way. But nonetheless, you know, orthopedics is definitely a uh, great place for digital therapeutics, RPM and RTM. Um, here's the crux of this, though. If RTM follows a similar trajectory as RPM, um, then there's little uptake that's actually expected in 2023. Um, this can be frustrating for certainly the investors, um, as well as the digital therapeutic companies themselves, because it does take some time for adoption. In 2023, we're going to be fighting against the commercial insurers, ultimately, and sending in these CPT codes and hoping and keeping our fingers crossed that they will reimburse. Um, hopefully, a lot of them will, but even with that expectation, we see the growth of actual uptake of some of these RTM codes being about 1,000 HCPs by 2024. So um, <laughs> not to end on a, again, we all need to drink now, um, but uh, um, it's somewhat of a, a depressing note. But I do think that, you know, like I said, orthopedics in general could actually lead the charge here for a much bigger adoption. So, you know, in terms of optimistic view, um, 1,000 providers adopting RTM by mid-2024. <laughs> um, and you know, looking at some of this in terms of the claims and in terms of what the total TAM is, it can be a little bit slow. But this does take time, I would say, over the next seven years, five to seven years, which is the typical curve for adoption, we'll, of course, see quite a bit more uptake. Um, but you know, I would say that. When choosing your 
RTM or DTX or RPM providers, one of the things to look for is certainly what their runway is and the reality that it's gonna take some time for adoption. Um, and uh, knowing that when you choose your partners that you might not wanna choose necessarily like a fly-by-night organization um, and hoping that they can be there with you for the long run. Um, but uh, it's, it's an interesting time in digital therapeutics. So thank you. Do we have questions? Oh. Sure. Um, so it seems like the behavior patterns of our industry, being the Yoda of the industry, I consider you the Yoda, um, is dependent on the flow of money. Seems like the entire industry is functioning on behavior following where money is placed. Do you think that'll ever change? Um, you know, in terms of behavior following bubble, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> there, you know, I think it's, it's uh, exciting and certainly there is that Russian flow of money. Um, I don't know that that will entirely change. The bubble is bursting a little bit. Um, but I think that's actually causing some people to double down and take a little bit closer look at where they're investing and what's got the legs mm. to go longer. Like I said, pharmaceutical companies in particular, I think in digital therapeutics, align well on their clinical evidence and the time it takes for them to get a drug to market. If they treat it with that same philosophy, um, then it should, it should play out over time like a pharmaceutical would. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, wonderful. Please thank Anne. Please, Stefano will close this event for at least before drinks. Until tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, wow, thank you so much, Mohan. I want to bring up Dr. Vail with me again. Here, let me share a microphone with you. Number one. Thank you. Uh, it was a big day. Thank you for sticking it out. We covered a lot of ground. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I want to compliment all the speakers. What struck me is how hardworking, how serious, how insightful, how complicated this is. It's not all razzle dazzle and it's not easy, as we just heard from Anne. Yeah. And I love the drilling down into very specific technologies and then backing up to the high level and saying, where does this fit in? How do we think about it uh, contextually? So wonderful job oh, putting thank together you. that yeah. uh, program. And, and congratulations to the speakers. It was a great day. That was an amazing team that really pulled us together. Uh, we covered, like I said, a lot of ground, and finishing up here with these very interesting new technologies, whether it's a blockchain or digital transformations, but also, to me, seeing the impact of applying digital technology also is in the revenue cycle. We don't talk about that enough, but it's the it's a, it's a backbone. We like to talk about therapeutics and yeah. diagnostics. Yeah, oh, that was very cool. Yeah. Yeah, but seeing how we can manage that, but also hearing also from Mohan afterwards, yes, but they will, of course, create this battle of the bots. Uh, but it'll be really fun. So um, I was trying to figure out if we should do a team photo today or tomorrow. What do you think? We're a little more fresher Let's tomorrow. Do it today. We can do it tomorrow. today? Oh, here, we'll do it again tomorrow. <laughs> so if you guys stick around, it'd be great if you come up to the stage. We'll leave the, let's go back a slide. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, the slide, the our general slide. The Docker SF slide, can you bring that up? That's the one, perfect. So if everybody could come up on stage uh, and join me here and we'll take our, our, our yearly team photograph. All right, that's good. All right, you guys look so excited. <laughs> Thank you.